Hello, is this thing on? My name is Brett, and you're on the internet watching me like I do every week. Well, almost every week. I don't know why I have to say that. I, I, it's like 52, 51 weeks out of a 52 year I'm live. So it's basically every week. In fact, we've got a bunch of travel coming up and conferences are back. <laughs> In fact, um, it, it's feeling like 2017, 2018 again, which was like the peak, I don't know, the peak DevOps slash container native timeline for me was when we were speaking, when I was speaking twice a week in public, twice, sorry, not twice a week, twice a month, somewhere in the world in public. That was a lot. And I'm not sure I want to go back to that, but it was a lot of fun. But we've got, uh, let's see, we've got conferences coming up. Uh, there's, well, we'll get into that later. I don't want to go through all the list, but suffice to, to say, I'm still going to be here live, even when I'm traveling. So we're already planning a trip 
in June uh, to Portland, and I'm going to be live from Portland. And then we've got, we possibly are going to be in Ireland, maybe London, uh, Chicago for KubeCon. Haven't heard anything about De uh, DockerCon yet. I don't know if that's even going to happen, but we had they, ha they usually have a DockerCon this month. Almost every year for 10 years, there was, there's been a DockerCon this month. And we haven't heard a word yet. So I feel like Docker's got something in store. They won't tell us. Anyway, welcome to the show. My name is Brett. We are here for an hour, maybe two. It depends on how long my voice lasts. And my camera today is deciding to not focus on my face. So that's a, maybe a problem that's going to have to be fixed during the show. Nothing like repairs to your equipment during a live stream. All right, so first up, if you haven't been here before, this is live, if you're watching it live on a Thursday. If not, come back on Thursdays. We do this, I do this the same time. Uh, on New York time, it is at 1 p.m., so that's Eastern. And yes, we have daily savings time, so that might also affect when this goes live, depending on the time of year. But I do this live, and then it becomes a podcast. So you can get the podcast below. The podcast gets edited down. We have guests every other week. Uh, a lot of times, Matt Williams is with me, my new co-host this year. And I feel like it could be like that, um, like the Daily Show on Comedy Central, where maybe we bring in other uh, other guest hosts. I've actually been talking to a few that might come back on a regular basis, and that might be fun to sort of have various people on, right, for multiple times. I think that's pretty cool. Um, no, I do not want my computer backed up while I'm streaming. All right. Um, but you get to ask questions. So get your questions in. That's why I'm here. I'm here to talk about DevOps, talk about containers. What are you learning? What do you want to learn? What do you need to know? How can I help? Think of this as like you're, you're in the flesh tech support hotline for anything automation and containers. So <laughs> doesn't mean I'm going to know the answer, but I might be able to point you in a quicker direction. All right, so I've got some things I'm working on. I'd love to talk about things that I've been talking about lately. I've got all sorts of things I can cover, but the goal is to get you answers. And if you're interested in discussing topics, I'm happy to discuss those. It's just you and me this week, just you and me. No guests, no co-host, just me, this misbehaving camera. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm drinking because if you didn't know, a little behind the scenes, these shows, this show where you and I are just Q&Aing and it's about courses and my content and you know what I'm doing, these tend to run long, like two hours long. And so I have to drink tea in one of my special mugs. This is me self-promoting. Um, we have a swag store, in case you can probably see this stuff in the YouTube channel now. Uh, and I have to drink tea, it's called throat coat, because otherwise I will lose my voice. This is a part of getting old. I started to lose, I didn't, didn't happen five years ago, it's happening now. So I have to drink special tea because I talk a lot. So hopefully you have some beverage because we've got to stay hydrated and we're gonna talk about stuff. And I like to hit the mic with my tea as I'm drinking it to exaggerate the fact that I'm trying to sell you a coffee mug. Anyway, I love coffee, so I have another mug, <laughs> which I've put stickers on, which we don't have for sale. I don't sell the stickers because it's not economical to sell you a tiny laptop sticker once and then mail it to you because the stickers cost 30 cents and the, the rest of it would cost $15. So um, you have to come find me at a conference. In fact, if you didn't know, it's maybe gonna be up, I haven't updated it sadly, um, I'm not sure that it has the rest of the year on it, but if you didn't know, over here at find me, brettfisher.com slash find me, uh, it's a list of all of my speaking things. I mean, going back in time, which I, the only use going back in time is, is it's all of my talks. So conference talks that are online, or if I have the notes or the slides or whatever, all that stuff is there. And so far this year, I did not go to Amsterdam. That was my plan, but uh, it got too expensive. So I just kind of ducked out. I'm going to Chicago. So if you're going to be at KubeCon Chicago, let's hang out. Like that's the best part is these conferences are meeting new cool people and hanging out with smart people that teach me things in the real world. That's essentially why I 
go to conferences. If all the videos are online, what's the reason of going to the conference? It's to meet the people. So I try to meet new people and hang out with new people all the time. At KubeCon, I met some new Docker captains. Shout out to a few of you that are out there that maybe are watching right now. And that was a lot of fun. So we hung out and became besties all in a matter of days. So that's over at brettfisher.com slash find me. Um, the goal there is really to just get you, to, for us to find out if we're going to be at the same conference and we sync up. So, um, On Secu is celebrating four months of membership. Finally catch a live show again. <laughs> Hope everyone is doing great. So one of our, one of the key members in our community uh, on Secu, by the way, over here, devops.fan, that's where our Discord's at. We're over 13,000 people. Um, lots of conversations about uh, Swarm mm -hmm. lately. I almost said Slack. Not Slack. We don't talk about Slack. We're on Discord. That's more fun than Slack. Um, this week, in fact, just yesterday, we were talking about Sid from DevOps Directive. Let me just name drop a couple of things here. So if you don't know about Sid, um, Sid has a YouTube channel. Let's go find that. So if you just uh, if you just search over here for DevOps Directive on YouTube, so it's a pretty great channel, and let me put the link here for you to go find it. But Sid talks about all the same things I talk about, only in a more consolidated, polished format. I love it, and he. Uh, has a Terraform course. Now he's got this Docker course trying try, uh, for almost five hours of YouTube videos. It's amazing. Um, GitHub Copilot, my, one of my one of my favorite new things of the last couple of years. I've been using it for a year and a half. I love GitHub Copilot. So go check out his content. Anyway, we were on Discord. I'll have to pull that up. And he was asking about... Um, Let's get this to load. So we were having this conversation in the Docker channel about, my lights look low. Let's fix that. There we go. Um, we were having this conversation around signal processing and init processes. So you probably have, in the container world heard more about init or PID zero processes, or I'm sorry, PID ones. Is it PID ones or PIDs? PID ones. Um, essentially the initialization process that we normally have in Linux as something called system D or supervisor or um, system D is pretty much what everyone uses nowadays. But in containers, container apps don't always know how to control their sub processes or processes they spawn. And they also don't always know how to receive or properly send shutdown signals. So when you send an application in Linux, like any other app, um, any other OS, there's a signal that the kernel tells the application, hey, I need you to properly shut down in a healthy, stable way. Most of our apps, well, I'm not gonna say most, I'm gonna say some of our apps do this out of the box by default. It, it just happens, it works. When you write your own programs, though, especially in well, in the languages I know, particularly in Node.js and Python, so the JavaScript language for Node.js framework and Python are the two that I know I've tested. I've got a feeling that all the rest are the same. They don't process a signal for shutdown unless you tell them to. Out of the box, they're not going to know how to healthy shut down. So they may just hang, and this is what they'll do if you just write a basic little Python script and you put it in a container and then you do a Docker stop, it might take 30, uh, let's see, def Docker's default I think is 10 seconds. So 10 seconds later, it shuts down. Why did it take 10 seconds? Especially if it was just a simple little program. That's because it didn't know how to, how to handle that signal. It didn't capture the signal. It wasn't listening for the signals. And there's multiple signals for shutdown. There's also a kill signal. We've all probably done a kill command or a pkill or, you know, we forced an application to quit because it wasn't responding. That's different. That's what happens after a timeout. On Docker, it's 10 seconds. On Kubernetes, I believe it's 30 seconds by default. You can change both of these. But 
one of the things that as you get into a more senior level of understanding containers, and I talk about this in several of my DockerCon talks, actually 2019, I think I talked about it again in 2022, that you start to get a, you get a little bit deeper into the knowledge of Linux and, and how your application behaves. And this is more important nowadays than ever, because once we all adopted containers, we were respawning, we were upgrading faster, we were respawning our apps faster, we were launching more instances and scaling up and down dynamically. And what does that have us doing? We're starting and stopping apps way more than we used to and not wanting downtime, right? 10 years ago, it was very common for me to see, see companies, even five years ago, it was still very common for me to see clients coming on board and they don't update that app but once a quarter. And when they do, it's an, out, an outage window. It's a maintenance window. Um, the reality today is our apps have to start quickly. They have to stop quickly. They need to be agile so they can move around and if we don't interrupt our customers, whoever those are, the internet, you know, your internal employees, maybe it's just an API that the customer is another web app that's talking to the API. And all these things need to be lean and fast in terms of startup and shutdown. So we care way more about that nowadays than maybe we did before because we're doing it way more often. This leads us to having to understand signaling because more importantly for a shutdown, your application may not behave as you expect. It may not properly send termination signals to those long polling HTTP connections, for example. It may not tell that WebSocket connection uh, a particular TCP packet to, hey, disconnect and reconnect to a new no new server. These are all things that are supposed to happen, especially in HTTP where it gets a little complicated, where we've got long polling connections. We have lots of different length and type of connections in HTTP. If you have a database connection, that's typically something that you configure in the driver. You tell the driver, I only want maximum of five connections at once. I want you to reuse connections. Um, you know, there's a timeout value for how long it stays connected to the database server. Those of us that know about connections from 20 years ago, that's what we worried about 20 years ago. We, we were mostly managing database performance connections because we didn't, unless you were running Google at the time, you didn't have a million people or 10,000 people all trying to use your app at the same time. I think that's way more common nowadays as we have the internet of things, as we all have smartphones. There's a lot of uh, potential for any one application on the internet to get a lot of connections. Maybe you're being DDoSed, all those things. So you care more about this shutdown, and that means you need to care about signals. This brought us to a conversation that was started on the, on the channel around um, when is the real use case for an init process in a container? If you go start reading the internet and you find out about things like Teeny, uh, there's other ones. My favorite has always been Teeny ever since I learned about it because Docker added it to the Docker engine and built it in. So you can type docker run dash dash init and it will inject the teeny process to start your app. So if you think about it, it's Docker, Docker engine, then it's container D, container D starts run C and then run C would normally start your app in the container. But when you inject something like teeny, it will, the run C then runs teeny and then teeny is the first process in your container. It has to be in the, in the image. And unless you're doing the Docker run init, that's kind of the special thing about that Docker run option is it injects it real time into the container. I don't think it copies it in. I'm, I'm guessing it just essentially bind mounts in the binary. That's, I'm not actually sure how it does it, but I'm pretty sure that's how it does it. Uh, so it injects that into the container. It runs that. And then that app run, looks for and finds your application, right? So it's managing your app. Two things, two things. In short, the two things it does that for is to pass those signals like sig term, all right, sigint. It passes those signals. There's lots of other signals they can pass, but those are the two that we're talking about right now. It, it, it passes those properly into the app. A great example of that sometimes is if you use an NPM with Node.js. NPM doesn't accept signals properly for whatever reason. It doesn't pass those to your application properly. So what I like to do is if I've got to use NPM, I'll use Teeny in front of that. Uh, you can write your apps to listen for signals, accept them, and shut down. I have an example of that, actually, several examples of that. Uh, if you basically just go to my profile on Google or on a GitHub, github.com, Brad Fisher. And if you just look for anything on Node.js, there will probably be something in there about a signal. So if I go in here, um, 
trying to think if I do a teeny search for teeny. Yeah. So in the, okay. So it's in the readme. So for example, in my, this Docker file, I actually install teeny from apt-get. You can also download the binary, but it's in all, all the package managers nowadays. So I just put it in from the package manager. And then I make that my entry point, which means whatever command I put down here, it, it's always going to use teeny and the dash dash passes. It tells teeny basically start this application from teeny. So this node app becomes a sub process to teeny. Now teeny is managing that process. And if node, for example, starts to spawn other processes or other processes are started in this container, hopefully they'll all be sub processes of teeny. And if they become zombies, that's the, that's the second factor. First factor is the first reason we're doing this is we're passing signals to an application that maybe isn't able to listen for signals properly. And then the second factor or the second reason is this is a process designed to look for and reap or kill zombie processes. And a zombie process is a process that doesn't have a parent um, or maybe its parent isn't able to get rid of it. So this teeny right here is what's going to help manage that for us. There are some people, and this is, we have many opinions in this in the industry. There are some people that are like, always use Teeny, especially use Teeny when you're writing your own program. Chances are, if you're a, if you run a MySQL engine or if you're using Postgres, you're running some other formal, well done application, Nginx, whatever. Those applications are going to, they're going to listen for signals properly. They're going to take those signals and they're going to do proper shutdown. So they're fine as PID1. It's your custom applications that don't have listeners in them for signals. Those are the ones that are going to need Teeny. Often what this happens is we, we, will, we often will need to do this when we accept someone else's app. And it is a custom app, but it doesn't have listeners for shutdown signals. So we need to then either change the app, or maybe we don't have the authority or the capability, the skills or whatever, to change that app so that it's listening for signals and doing proper shutdown. So that's one way, or we, we're not allowed to touch it. So we, we essentially have to put something, we have to inject something to manage zombie processes and to properly pass signals. And so that's when I use it. I often am working with teams, they're using other people's open source, they might be writing their own, but we sort of set the standard of, hey, look, for example, in the case of Node or Python, we're just going to always use Teeny as out of a caution, out of a sorry, out of an abundance of caution. So, um, getting back to the Sid thing, Sid was asking uh, correctly. Like, I can't find any real world examples of this. You know, I'm looking on the internet and everyone's writing that we should be doing this, but why? Like, what's the real? What's going to happen? What What are the horror stories or the failure stories of people that don't do this? Because we need to tell those stories. It's this. This shouldn't just be an imaginary cautionary tale. It should have some teeth behind it on why you need to do this. Um, yeah, and we've got some opinions, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the unsecure. The reason I say that I think Python doesn't do it is if you write a Hello World Python app and you run it just, you know, Python something.py file, if you run that in a container from the command, right, with no entry point, and then you do, like, let's say you do it um, without a dash D, so you're interactive and you're attached, and then you do a control C, it should take 10 seconds for it to stop. I haven't checked recently. Maybe they fixed it or added something in 3. something uh, Python. But the way that you always know is if you start it and then you immediately try to stop it, either control D or Docker stop, and if it takes 10 seconds rather than one second, if it takes one second, that's probably the proper normal shutdown, right? If you write your own shutdown process, you can take as long as you want. This gets into a whole other thing around health checks and uh, graceful shutdown of applications that need to handle like uh, connection shutdown, for example. If you've got 5,000 connections, you're, you're counting those connections and you need to send each one of those a SIN packet to tell them, hey, browser, you need to reconnect because I'm about to quit. And that reconnection will cause it to go to a different pod. For example, that's something that load balancers and Kubernetes do, but that requires your application do healthy, proper shutdown. Most ecosystems of tooling, most frameworks will have something like that, that you can plug in as a module or um, 
you know, a PIP, a PIP add-on or something like that, that will handle that for you. And then you don't have to write your own code. Um, my experience though, especially with Node.js, cause that's the one I have the most experience with. It definitely doesn't do it out of the box. So I always have to write an example and I'm not even sure I have, let me see if I have one on the top of my head. I have to write an example of, you know, 10 lines of code that will properly listen for the signal and then just do a quit. But if I did want, I needed to do more than a quit in my application and I actually needed to handle all of the connections properly because maybe I, maybe I have people uploading files right now to that web server. If I shut down that web server, it kills their shut, their kills their upload. If they're, if it's a video processing site or an image processing site, I don't want to interrupt them. So I have to build into my app, usually with some sort of third party module, uh, the ability to watch for those you know, track the connections, be aware of what's happening in the connection, and then properly shut those connections down. Um, the easiest way to do that is to get a third-party tool that can track, because there's a, there's overhead in this. Some of them will track in memory, some will track in Redis, um, track all the connections. And then the, the sort of the easy way to do this is instead of actually going knowing what's going on in the connection, you send somewhere else. It's quite, fan, quite honestly, it's fancier and more in-depth than I even understand. A lot of times, um, especially per language and per framework on exactly how it understands what's happening in the HTTP connection right now and when is the proper time to send a send packet. I, I pretend that I know what I'm talking about there, but I don't have the in-depth knowledge that um, a developer would have about that. I am usually the person helping them from, you know, I'm the one inspecting the packets, looking at the network, looking at the server behavior and helping us figure out did we properly shut down those 5,000 connections? <laughs> Did we properly send them to the new pod? So anyway, what, this long story, this is a really long story. I'm sorry, I'm dragging this out. Um, Sid was trying to come up with a way to explain it. And it looks like he's on a pretty good, pretty good clip, not to spoil it or anything. I think he might, maybe he's writing a video. Who knows? Um, but yeah, he was trying to come up with a graphic that, would explain uh, SIGINT and SIG term handling and how your apps do it. And then the other side of that, so if the if the termination isn't healthy, then applications can get into a zombie state where they don't have a parent process that will shut them down. And that's zombies, zombie process handling. So there's really these two sides of the coin. If everything goes well, we don't need a zombie process reaper. We just need to handle signals. That's assuming everything goes well. Sometimes, your application can spin off third-party executables. That's where it happens the most. In my experience, what when it goes wrong, it's when our applications don't do something in the language, they call out to curl or they call out to some other tool. Um, that tool doesn't get proper signal handling from the main app because the main app doesn't know to pass signals properly. And so maybe when one app is shut down, it doesn't shut down all of its sub-processes. That's when zombies happen. And uh, usually to me is when it's when it's processing the exact boundary. It's when an application calls out to run a different binary. And that process has, you have to test that. You can't just assume that everything's going to go well. What if curl's down? Now, the curl's just an example. I doubt that curl is one of the most common misbehaviors because it's very popular. It's It's had lots of bugs and work. But there's a lot of other tooling we might all use. What if you're in the middle of zipping a tarball with the tar command and your node app shuts down, but it doesn't send the you know it's doesn't send the signals or it doesn't capture signals correctly. Let's say that your node does, doesn't capture signals. So then, after the thirty seconds, Kubernetes tells the container engine to kill the node app, and the node app, when it's killed, has no option. It has no way to stop its sub processes. When it's killed, it has no say. It has no control. So it's killed, and all of its sub processes are still there those are now zombies and it's a question of how does the runtime handle it do we have an init process um these are all real world problems so it's a pretty cool diagram uh i haven't actually inspected it yet to see if if it's going to be correct but i'm looking forward to maybe sid writing up something about it um so the the part of this was i discovered long ago this problem in production and so I started talking about it in 2019. So I have this video. I'm just gonna copy the link in case you're interested. <laughs> Eric is watching it two times speed. I didn't even know that was possible. Um, 
Yeah, Lee says, I'm more inclined to use Supervisor D. I would absolutely use Supervisor D if, and only if, I needed to manage multiple processes. The only reason I'm saying that is because Supervisor is, you're usually gonna need a config file for the app. Um, the the biggest reason, and the probably the only reason left that I use Supervisor in a container, in my own workflows, is if I'm on Docker or Swarm where I can't, I don't have the concept of a pod, I can't ensure that two containers are always together. And I want to run something like PHP and Nginx together, and they're gonna share a socket. So the fastest way to get my Nginx web server or my Apache web server HTTP traffic into PHP, which doesn't speak HTTP, right? The the PHP, F, you know, PHP FPM, whatever the PHP binary might be, mod PHP, whatever it is, that that needs a socket connection, or right? it's, it's it's the most performant on socket. You can do TCP; it's faster to go socket. I've tested it, so um, I think it's maybe maybe a little memory less memory usage. It's you don't add this network stack over, overhead. Anyway, you that you ideally in a large uh, solution, you want to do that socket. But in order to do that, they both have to have access to the same file. So they either need to be guaranteed to be in the same pod and have access to the same volume or shared file access to a socket, or they they need to be in the same container. And so I actually have an example of that. It's probably, um, I would I probably need to rewrite it. But anyway, on my GitHub, everything's on my GitHub. On my GitHub, if you just search PHP repos, there's a PHP repo example where I install both Nginx and PHP um, into the same container, and then I use a supervi supervisor D config file to tell those apps to run together. And so supervisor acts as init. It does a great job at that. That's its whole purpose. And it manages both processes, which means what happens when PHP shuts down, but Nginx is fine, right? Let's say PHP and uh, FPM crashes, or, and Nginx is fine, or vice versa. That's why you want something like Supervisor D, is it, it knows to restart. That's its whole purpose in Linux, is to not only start applications and manage them and reap zombies and all that, but to restart them if they fail. Because the reality is, is in a container, if you start two processes like that, it's no longer the job of Docker to restart the container if it stops. Technically, if you're running init, like if you're running something like Teeny or Supervisor D, Docker's only job is to make sure that process is running. It doesn't really know what's down the, down the line, what other processes that's running, right? So each process is only responsible for its uh, sub-processes and, and then just down the rabbit hole. So run C starts, after Docker starts, Docker starts container D, the container D starts run C, run C starts that process in a container. And if it's supervisor D, great. I just have to write the config file. The difference with init, I'm sorry, the difference with Teeny is Teeny doesn't need a config file. It's super simple. It runs one process. It is only meant to start a process and it's not meant to be a full system D or supervisor D um, scheduler. I don't know, um, process orchestrator? I don't know what we want to call that world different than Teeny. Teeny is, it's tiny. That's like, that's the purpose of it. It's super tiny. So that's kind of my, my going to is if I need more than one process, supervisor D, write the config file, if I don't need that, I just have a single process, but I need to manage signals, or I'm worried about the potential for zombie processes, that's when I use Teeny. This all came up, and I wanted to share a horror story. It's not mine, it's Datadog's. Um, it's from 2019 KubeCon. And the, some of you may have even seen this, because I think this, in 2019, I remember this talk sort of making the, making the rounds. Uh, it's called 10 Ways to Shoot Yourself in the Foot with Kubernetes. Number nine will surprise you. <laughs> um, a long title, but two guys from Datadog, I believe they're both from Datadog. I know at least one of them is. Um, going through a laundry list of real-world production Kubernetes stuff. All right, so this is the meat of this. This is the whole reason I'm talking about this. Is I, I want, We're on the topic of failure stories. So there is a website called K8S, k8s.af. So... Kates.af, that is a list of failure stories. I, I hope that it's being maintained. The most recent one is 2021, and that worries me a little bit because it's honestly a great list. I referenced this I, more than once. I've referenced this list because not only is it just, it's more than a playlist of YouTube videos. 
it is a list including the actual failures. So I couldn't remember when Sid and the other group in Discord were having this discussion around init processes. And I remember that my my reason for inits, besides just programs that I write or people that I work with write, not handling signals, I remember specifically execs. So Docker execs or exec probes in Kubernetes, anything that basically spawns a secondary process or an additional process inside a running container, those are one of the failure areas for that inits are good to handle. In other words, execs can go badly and they can go very badly. Um, they can consume all CPU and resources and memory on a server if you're not careful. Uh, they're also high, they tend to be, and historically, if you go back into the Docker issues, exec processes tend to be very costly compared to other sort of what you would assume would be a simple health check, exec health checks where it has to spawn a new process inside your container every five seconds or every second or whenever you're doing your health checks. That can be very costly on your resources. It also has a big potential for becoming zombied or be, or needing zombie reaping, um, rogue processes essentially. And there's all sorts of, uh, I, I would say I've seen multiple ways that this happens. One of the ways is if you're not using an init process and the process for the health check is slow or takes its time, it may not properly be shut down uh, because Kubernetes needs to do it again and again. I've seen it in scenarios where people incorrectly had very long timeouts on their probes, but very short um, periods. Meaning, I want this to start. I want this to happen every five seconds, but I'm going to give you five minutes of timeout. Which is, if you can imagine, if that became slow, if those processes took a while, you would suddenly have dozens and dozens all running concurrently because the, they're not able. They're not being killed and they're constantly spawning a new one every five seconds. So you're almost like DDoSing yourself at that point. So I, and I've seen this, I've seen companies where 25% of the CPU resources or more of their entire cluster are simply there for health checks. Like that's the only reason a quarter of their CPUs are needing are being used is to simply spawn execs, start up application that then spawns a health check and in most of those cases, the strategy is make make faster health checks. Don't use execs. In Kubernetes, you want to use HTTP or TCP connections. Those are way faster, way leaner, really no chance essentially of any zombie issues with that. Um, but if you have to start a separate process, make it lean and fast, make it handle, test rigorously that it handles signals, and then use a teeny with it, uh, use an init process. So that way there's no chance that it's going to be you know, there's very, 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 very little chance that it's ever going to be hanging around after it's killed. All right. So yeah, these talk titles are great. I love Yeah. Tommy's like uh, some of these. So anyway, the, the whole point of this great list is that I can search. So if I need to search a health check, like, or something like an exec process, and this is what I did yesterday. So I searched for exec and the, and the great work that is done by the team that made this is they go through the talk and they, they shortly document the uh, what was involved and the impact of that of those failures. And of course, in this one, they go through like 10 failures. So they had to list all this stuff. And what's great is they actually even do things like list part of the spec that was affected. So I couldn't remember the, the name of this talk. I knew I had watched it on YouTube multiple times. I was looking through YouTube history, that was a fail. And so I, I knew this website, found this website, and then I searched on exec and found this. Boom, that leads me to this part of the talk, which did I, yeah, I did send this link. So this link is up there in the chat. And in this example, they're showing from a sysadmin perspective, I love this because it's, this is not something that concerns just a developer. This example concerns developers and operators and DevOps or anyone who's involved in the life cycle of an app because it, it, teaches, it teaches us some fundamentals about how processes handle sub-processes and what's going on in a container. Some of us may have never even done a PS command inside a container or against the containerd shim in this case. In this case, um, we've got the shim that starts, oh, I don't wanna play that video. Uh, the containerd shim, it's kinda hard, it's a little small to see there, but the containerd shim actually starts the Redis server. And then the Redis server 
in this case, what they're saying is this this is actually not the mass the, the main Redis server. This was a clone or a, a secondary, and it was these were using the Redis CLI as a health check, and that was using the, those Redis CLI health checks as a under a script. This is my understanding actually by looking at the talk. And so that script runs Redis CLI, which is something that comes with Redis. It's a standard tool, but that tool was slow and it was slower. It was slow enough that it was causing the container D because there's no, there was no init process involved here. They didn't have an init process for their probe. So the shell script is run and shell scripts can mess up signals too, by the way, you gotta be careful in shell scripts. Uh, because they can trap essentially signals that they don't get passed down to the process of the shell, shell scripts start. And so in this case, you had a sort of a cascading failure effect of process starts, process starts, process. It kept ran, running the Redis CLI. They had, uh, let's see, what does he say in here? They had, yeah, uh, 16,000 processes in a zombie state. And the, that you know, that's going to kill any server. <laughs> And it was an innocent situation. It wasn't really even, we would might, I love how they talk in this talk about, um, is it the fault of the engineer or is it the fault of the tooling or is it the fault of documentation? And they, they love to not point the fingers at people and say like, that's your fault. Um, they talk at how the tools fail. And in this case, there's potentially multiple areas of failure. One would be, I would start everything with init, an init process, including health checks. Um, maybe not the Redis server itself, but certainly the health checks need to be started in an init. Um, one of the questions I actually have, and maybe we have someone on the on the horn um, that would maybe know this answer. I think that if you were to start this Redis server with Teeny, that then the health checks would be also captured by Teeny in that container because they're technically started as a secondary process. I'm not sure about that. I, I I would have to actually test it to believe that that worked. But the safe way to do this is in your probe. In this case, they were doing an exec probe, that the most costly type of uh, probe for Kubernetes. And I always try to avoid them. But in the case of Redis, the easiest thing to do is a Redis CLI ping. And a lot of us just do that. You, you can even test authentication with things, with like my uh, Postgres will have a client. And you can use the Postgres client to test connection and you can test authentication. And that's, I don't know, in some ways a more costly health check, but I kind of like it because it also validates that the API account or whatever I'm using to access the database from the app is still good. <laughs> um, so you can, you know, obviously there's different setups you can do for that, but those things are all gonna be an exec probe. So I'm gonna be very careful about that. I am going to slow that down and not run it every second. That's too costly for me. I maybe I'm gonna run that every 15 seconds, maybe every 30 seconds. Um, anyway, depending on the setup, right? Like I'm not trying to run a cloud myself, so I'm, I'm okay with 30 seconds of downtime before we start. Anyway, this process, uh, this is in the, there, this uh, list. You can go check this out. That's a great talk. There's a ton of stuff in here, quite honestly, it was actually, there's so much stuff in just this one 37 minute talk that I've watched it multiple times. And I, we, we rewatched a little bit last night and realized I have forgotten everything. I have to watch it again. There's so many examples of production outages here. And that's just one of the talks that are on this list. I honestly think that I would need a week or two to go through all of these truly and truly digest what the behavior changes that I may need to employ in order to recover or to avoid some of these stuff. By the way, a lot of these are about resource utilization and DNS. <laughs> like if there's if there's a trend up amongst all these failures, it's uh, out of hand applications, and it can be more than just applications. It can be Kubernetes itself. It can be probes. It can be the applications. Anyway, resources uncontrolled or systems not handling resource control properly, that's a common theme. And then the other one is DNS, DNS, DNS. Um, one of the, in fact, one of the things in this talk, in that actual talk I just showed you, was talking about, do they have it in here? Yeah, in dots, uh, which has to do with DNS resolution. And I apologize now for the, on behalf of DNS, um, if you're someone who's had to deal with in dots in your life, 
let's let's talk about it for a second. Like that that part of your life should never had to happen. And I apologize that DNS sucks and is complicated and um, it's stupid. It's stupid. Um, in fact, it's so stupid that today, after four years, I, one of the things that reasons I don't like to recommend an Alpine based distribution for a troubleshooting tool is that if you are in the habit like me of using NS lookup, I know NS lookups old tool and we got better tools now, but I, my, my habits die hard and NS lookup inside of it, any Alpine image from, that I'm aware of over the last four years has had broken in NS lookup. It doesn't resolve DNS correctly. It's been documented and documented and documented. It's actually the fault, not of Alpine, but of BusyBox. And I'm not smart enough to fix it. <laughs> no one else has fixed it. And it's still a bug. And I just keep upvoting the issues and watching everybody else complain about it. Meanwhile, this is one of those cases where like, no one really cares, no one's gonna fix it, and that's fine. But it's one of the reasons why you've gotta understand DNS. I'm sorry about in dots. I, I'm here to apologize. I feel like I need a sound. There we go. Yeah. D it's often DNS. Um, DNS caching will, will haunt you. In dots will haunt you. Um, what else? Packet sizes of DNS queries have haunted me. <laughs> uh, limits on the size of packets to a DNS server because a DNS server packet can be sometimes larger than it should. And um, anyway, there are people, yeah, I'm sure that someone in chat's gonna be like, yeah, my colleagues wasted three days because of it does. I'll be honest, I think I went my whole career, like let's say, 50, let's say I've been using Linux for 20 years, but in terms of it actually being a major feature of my career is maybe only the last 15. So the last 15 years. So of the last 15 years, I don't think I ever had to really know about N dots. And even if I did, I never really, like I maybe just configured it and just thought it was an interesting thing. Never had to care until the, the world of containers. It's something about <laughs> the fact that we've got DNS in front of our DNS in front of our DNS that has caused me to have to care so much about DNS and, uh, you know, in cluster DNS. Traditionally, if you've been around a long time, like sysadmins, man, I was running DNS for so many companies. Like that was our thing. Like one of the coolest things to do back in the nineties when DNS was fresh and hot and TCP was the new, you know, IP was the new hotness. We had all these old protocols, IPX, I see we're at NetBuoy, NetBIOS. I know you people, uh, ThickNet, ThinNet, all those wonderful things. And then we moved to the world of IP and we could have a name server. Now we had had name servers before, but they were, they were clunky and limited and I, you know, they weren't great. Um, DNS at the time it was sort of came out and I learned about it in the mid nineties. It was so cool to set up a DNS server in your company and then get all your servers and even all of your windows computers or even your, your DOS computers, anything that was speaking IP to actually have its own DS, DNS name and then to control your own DNS server. And then basically, and if you, I don't know if any of you are windows people, but back in the day, Windows had this feature that was like a checkbox. And on a DNS server and a DHCP server, and this is, by the way, this this was fancy technology 30 years ago. Today, it's just automatic everywhere. But it was, the, I remember the moment, or not specifically, but I remember the feeling of that moment when I got my DHCP server via a checkbox that anytime someone asked for an IP and got it, it would go tell the DNS server that name. And um, it was that, that was the beginning of DDNS, right? dynamic DNS. And so anytime a computer went and got a new IP address and I could make reservations now. So this is the beginning of us not, not needing static IPs. And I remember that um, getting that to work and being able to find anything on the network through DNS was the most amazing feeling. It was like God mode on a network of a thousand nodes. Um, it was a celebratory moment. I believe. <laughs> So th that was exciting days of DNS, but I never, I don't remember ever having to care about N dots at the time. Maybe I did, maybe I cut it out. Maybe I stopped remembering that that was a thing, but it wasn't again until containers that I had to care about N dots. All right, um, I need questions in chat. So um, thank you, Lee, for the comment. Yes, it can always be helpful to implement signal handling. Um,
Ooh, this is a good tip. This is like a good hit to, uh, tip here. Monitoring with Prometheus for bad exit codes related to bad shutdown behavior has helped us a tremendous amount in identifying these issues. That is a perfect example. I love that. It's super simple, um, meaning that a lot of times, especially if there's if you had to kill an app, there's not going to be an exit code from the app. But if you're able to capture that something had to be killed, as well as the exit codes for applications that die, that basically quit themselves because they aired out 127, whatever, anything but zero. Um, that that is a, technically that's reactive, but it, that's a really great explanation of someone that just reviews that log weekly. Um, that almost seems like an SRE type moment of someone who's watching the behavior of the system in real time, seeing improper shutdown codes, reviews them, maybe not in the moment, because maybe it didn't actually cause an outage, right? So it's not a priority one issue because things all were brought back up. But ideally, in a perfectly functioning cluster, things are stopping all the time and they should always be stopping zero. So uh, health check should be stopping at zero. Containers should be stopping with zero. So our apps and our, our a lot of our monitoring tools even don't capture that out of the out of the gate. Um, that's a great uh, example. I would love to see a video because there's two sides of that coin. How do I find that Docker or Kubernetes or my runtime had to kill something, and how do I see exit codes from my apps themselves? You might be able to capture that with the same query, but it feels like that's maybe two different places. Anyway, I would love to see a video showing how to do that because that's the kind of thing that I would just make, basically make default in every cluster. Every time I, I deploy a monitoring tool, do that. Because um, yeah, it's, it's like a leading indicator of bad behavior. Ooh, okay. Uh, evidently there's a, how we removed all 502 errors by caring about PID1 in Kubernetes. I know I'm probably butchering this, but Osgur, thank you so much. Um, thanks for that. Yeah, too many name servers and name searches in combination with in dots is fun. And yeah, if you, I mean, at some point in your career, if you have to handle servers or if you're d dealing with distributed computers, which is everybody nowadays, um, MTUs are one of those things that we, 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 you used to have to actually type this in. Like this was something that we actually had to configure on an, a network device, an ethernet device, a thin net device. Mm -hmm. So um, nowadays it's just handled automatically. Everything in our world just handles packet size automatically. So it's it's almost forgettable. Like 99.9% .9 of technologists can forget about MTU, but that 0.1% of us that don't, it, it that's what saves <laughs> that's what saves the cloud sometimes because we're like, I wonder if it's MTU, and you you go and you look. What's the size? What's the MTU of my server? What's the MTU of my receiving server? Are is there something in the way that's changing it? Um, I've probably even lost all my old skills for tracking that because I, I used to have to care about that a lot more 15 years ago. When you were designing your own data centers and you had all this disparate equipment, you had Intel NICs and you had Broadcom NICs and you had three different kinds of switches and two different kinds of routers in a data center. Um, and you were trying to do like back when one gig was fast or nowadays, you know, 10 gig, 20 gig. You you really you were you were tweaking that because you wanted to improve performance, and we all had to squeeze extra CPU out. And this maybe is before we even had um, network offloaders, network chips for offloading uh, performance. Anyway, I'm showing my age. The README has a sample Prometheus query. Oh, what README? The README of Prometheus? <laughs> yes. What's up, Toby? Exit status. That's what we're talking about. All right, exit status. I think you all are trying to help me. Fill my knowledge gaps. Really, I mean, this story, this story time and this Q&A goes either way. Like, you teach me stuff. I try to teach you stuff. We all learn together. Um, what else? So, you know, let's just pretend this is mid, this is the mid roll ad. Um, I don't do a lot of promotion. Maybe in the future we'll get promotion videos, um, like ads in the videos. But hey, let me talk about what I'm doing. Hey, did you know I have a newsletter? You can get that newsletter at brett.news or link below. Um, that newsletter should have gone out today, 
but I didn't send it. So you'll be seeing another newsletter today or tomorrow. Um, yeah, so I rebooted the newsletter for like the 10th time. And it's very short. It mo it focuses mostly on the things that I'm creating because we usually have something coming out every week, whether it's a new podcast or a live show. Um, this week, I talked about Git in the newsletter. So if you're not on my newsletter, again, bread.news or click the link down in the description. Um, totally free. It's only once a week. And I'm usually talking about things I'm learning, things I've, sh I've shared. Every once in a while, I'll put someone else's stuff in there. So this is definitely not the newsletter to give you like industry news and sum up the week. That is not me. I, you know, I feel like there's so many of those. I didn't want to make just another one. There's a lot of good ones. Last week we had Corey Quinn on the show talking about all the ways to run AWS containers. And if you haven't heard about Fork, it is a Git GUI. And I talked about this wonderful lengthy blog article I read called Git Good. And this gentleman, Chris, has a story to tell about the natural complexities of Git when you're dealing in a team environment across many, many repos. And I, I totally loved this article. Not only did I learn stuff, because he taught me some ways to do cherry pick picking in a GUI of the, the, a GUI that I use and I've paid for because I love this Fork app. Uh, yes, we have all sorts of other GUIs. We have Git Kraken, we have VS Code, we have op other open source ones um, that you know the Git project has several that have had for years. We have the GitHub tool that's built in. I mean, every IDE now has some sort of Git tooling in it, but I just keep coming back to Fork. I've talked about it on the show before. I share about it on the social because it is great. And um, it is a one-time purchase if you want to support them. It's just, I think it's just two people that build it, but it's a wonderful tool. And what I love is that he has little videos um, that walk you through various things like how to cherry pick interactively by sort of rebasing a, P, a, a branch that you might have in a PR request. Like it's just great stuff that I wish I'd had known how to do in a GUI 10 years ago. The one thing that I really that really spoke to me is at the beginning of the article talking about, let's see, um, he didn't quote it. He basically gives us permission to use a GUI. And Soapbox a moment, again, it is okay if you don't wanna learn all the command line tools and you wanna use a GUI. We are now entering, by the way, in the world of Docker, a, an era of Docker usage that I am personally seeing with new students where they're using the, the CLI less and less and less. Their IDEs have Docker built in. Docker has a desktop GUI built in. You can now start compose projects, start containers, manages your, manage your images, have a ton of plugins all in the GUI. So for Git as well, just like with containers, we're entering a time where the masses don't have to be a command or shell guru. And he gives us permission to be real developers, real DevOps people, and not do everything at, from, from Git at the command line. I, t I, for the longest time, only did the command line because I'm one of those people that when I learned Git over a decade ago, um, I, f I thought that in order to be a real, real hacker, a real developer, I had to focus, and at the time we really didn't have any good G Git GUIs anyway, but I was forced to use the command line because of my own ego. And he, in this wonderful post, talks about, you know, we have sites called like, oh shit, Git, uh, that basically gives you all these common problems and solutions. And I have years, for years and years and years, probably over a decade, kept my own list of my the, the Git commands that I can never remember to get myself out of a, essentially a broken commit that I didn't need to, need to make. Or I accidentally made a new branch instead of actually bringing a branch down from origin. You know, um, th there's all sorts of things that I would just break on my own with Git. And eventually, because I would break it so much at the command line, I would just delete and start over, right? Copy out the files you changed, delete the repo, re reclone it, copy my files back in after I fix my problem. I have done that untold number of times because I get myself stuck in the either, it's either the wrong command or the improper order of commands to do a workflow. Anyway, we've had all sorts of tooling be invented on top of Git to solve this complexity. 
he's giving us permission to just, hey, just use the GUI. And I admit, I now go GUI first on Git. I will have my, my IDE right here, and I'll have Fork right next to me because Fork can be watching all five repos all at once and allow me to quickly, more quickly than I would be able to move around different directories in the command line. It honestly allows me to make three commits ac across three repos that are all related, put, put those into a new branch, push it to origin, make a PR request. Like it can do all of that in just a few clicks and types. And a lot of the Git GUIs can do it. But for some reason for me, uh, Fork just really speaks to me. So anyway, what I love about this post was he, um, he shares exactly how he does his complex workflows of taking what is previously 50, maybe it's 50 Git commits of like, oops, fix mistake. Oops, fix this mistake. Oh, try it again. Try a sec try it again a second time, right? He's doing all this stuff, and it, it spans days of effort. And he shows how he 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 groups them. He basically merges them and rebases them to clean up his history. He also instead of just doing a squash, he actually cleans up history. He does rebasing. He does cherry picking. He does all this great stuff in like these little minute videos, way faster than I would take to to teach you. I would take an hour. It would just go on and on and on. But he's got these great little videos. Anyway, I'm going to send you last week's newsletter, in case you didn't know that. So, yeah, Dan is sympathizing with me. Um, and, yeah, so go read that newsletter. Sign up for it. Totally free. Uh, this week's will probably come out today or tomorrow. But, yeah, that was, that was what I was talking about last week. As another little ad, did you know we have merch? I have a little merch store. And right now, 15% off of everything. So you can get a discount. Um, you just click the redeem button and you'll get a discount on everything on our designs. We have, th this is basically the main stuff we have today. So this, these like eight different designs and then you can put it on different clothing. So if I check out Foxy, I've got shirts and mugs and all that stuff. So go check that stuff out. This was, all of this stuff, by the way, was original art created by, uh, either either it's my idea and I had one of my friends that are artists actually create it or it, it was my artist friend's idea and they created it. And like, I can't remember who came up with the Foxy idea, but I love Foxy. Foxy's like my unofficial mascot now because she's just so cute. Um, and like this sneaker net one, I actually thought that up um, with a friend of mine at lunch over beers. <laughs> we were having like an early, hap early happy hour. And I talked about, oh, wouldn't it be cool to like, you know, I, I talked about the idea of sneaker net and how that's a term that's basically dead now, but we used to use it all the time in the 90s and 2000s for basically walking. And we actually debated, do we do three and a three, uh, three and a half or five and a quarter? Uh, so we decided on the five and a quarter. I don't know what, what the renting argument was. And we, then we put ethernet on the, the shoelace. Yeah. So anyway, go check that stuff out. Um, that's my merch store. And then lastly, if you didn't know, we're currently taking enrollment for this brand new course we just launched this year. I'm in the middle of improving that for the next cohort, cohort of group of people, um, we are, so this is going to be a small group of people. We all spend two weeks, only one and a half hours every other day, learning GitOps and GitHub Actions. So we're, we're basically starting with GitHub Actions, learning how to build images, scan images, do all sorts of advanced stuff with images, like make PR comments about the image tags. How do you do cross platform building at the same time in parallel? All that stuff. And then we end the second week with pushing those applications we automatically built in GitHub Actions to Kubernetes the best way I believe there is today, which is using GitOps. And we're going to use Argo, and we show how to build the Argo system, how to add apps to it, and then how to automate that CI and CD bridge. Because a lot of times between the CI and the CD, there's, there is a manual effort for humans, and I want to eliminate that as much as possible. So we will go into how to make your own automation that every time you merge your actual app code and then those images are built, we will do a proper, and I say proper because there's other ways to do it that aren't proper, but a proper GitOps approach to updating your applications in 
environments, whether that's production or staging, and giving you, the human, a ready-made PR that if you just merge it, will then deploy to production in a true GitOps fashion. So that means everything's infrastructure is code. That means that we have reconciliation. So that means if, if something changes in the servers, it will it'll revert or fix that change if it's not properly done the GitOps way um, and all the other benefits of GitOps. So anyway, it's a great course. Uh, we had the first beta cohort earlier this year. Um, and that group gave me tons of great feedback. They evidently liked it because I at least got, I got some of them to give me a rating. So that's good. And we're now opening up enrollment for the second cohort. The second cohort will be in July. And this is all done live. So you will be doing live with me on Zoom over a period of two weeks, six times. And then you're going to get you're going to get prep work. You're going to get homework. And this is very hands on. So we're focusing on you doing these real things, not just on practice, which I will give you tons of practice stuff. But this is going to be also time for you to try this on your own code, of which people in the, the first group did. Try this on your real code and your real projects, and you're gonna get dedicated time each week with me and the class to review that. So we can ask questions, we can talk about what didn't work for you. It's gonna be great. Uh, I'm having so much fun with this format. I think that people get way more out of it. It's To me, it's, all, it's about hyper learning. It's about how can we distill down the real key things that you need to know with a little bit of customization just for you, and how can we make that cheaper than consulting, right? So it's cheaper than hiring a consultant to teach you, but it's way more time efficient and it's way more advanced and specific to your use case than maybe one of my Udemy courses, right? Because my Udemy courses can be, they have to be very generic, right? I don't know anything about you, I don't know anything about what you're working on, and I don't have specific uh, tooling to help you in your current situation. I just have to hope that I covered it in a, in a video course. In this course, this is fixing that because that's why it's live. So we can take those detours. We can have dedicated time every week to just focus on Q and A and solving your specific problems in your specific team. So tell your friends, tell your coworkers, um, this we're enrolling and we're, we, it's a limited size. We haven't really figured out whether it's going to be only 25 people, maybe uh, 35 people, maybe only 20, but um, we're still testing that now, trying to figure out what, what our max is. So you probably want to sign up earlier than later, just to make sure you have, uh, people have already signed up and it's in July. So you have to check that out. If you, by the way, can't make it in July, but you are interested in this course or any other future Maven courses, because this, this is the new platform I'm using. Um, Maven is a platform like Udemy but it's just for live courses. So I'm not switching platforms. I'm still working on Udemy, still have all the courses on Udemy. Those are pre-recorded. These are gonna be live courses taught by me in Zoom with a whole bunch of slides and homework for you. And if you if you can't make it this one, but you're interested in a future time, just get on the wait list, get on the uh, little email sign up there and um, check that out. So that's those are the two things I've been working on. <laughs> Newsletter, and the live course. Tommy is a proud owner of the Bare Metal t-shirt. <laughs> oh my goodness. My, that Bare Metal t-shirt, let me tell you, thank you so much for buying that. I appreciate you. <laughs> um, the Bare Metal t-shirt was a like a passion project because we wanted to make all we wanted to make all this stuff around two themes. 80s hair bands, like all of my favorite bands from the 80s. And the look of that, right? The, the concert t-shirts. And then also bare metal, like the love of bare metal, um, just working with real hardware instead of everything is virtual, everything is the cloud. And so we were, that, that's the origin of the bare metal t-shirt is we tried to, um, we had all these different ideas. And in case you're not, if you don't know what we're talking about, maybe I should just show you. Um, Cause it's, it is one of my favorite shirts. So the bare metal t-shirt, it's kind of styled after a particular band um, a metal band, but the surprise is actually on the back of the shirt. If you go to the back, it's kind of written almost like a tour shirt. And there's a, uh, I like, I like art that has a complexity or a nuance to it, sort of a hidden innuendo kind of thing. So this is a bear, not B E A R, not B A R E playing a guitar keyboard 
if you didn't know, we had keyboard guitars. That's still actually a thing, but it was a big deal in the 80s with synth, the origin of synth. Um, but this is not a regular keyboard. This is a computer keyboard, uh, and he has a DevOps tattoo. So if, you, if you've seen my DevOps logo around, which is on this mug, that, oh, this mug, that's the origin of that logo. So it actually was on the bear first, and then we realized, oh, that's a pretty cool logo. We should just make that a sticker. And then we started putting it on everything. But um, yeah, so we tried hard with this to make it, um, you know, funny. So w story on that, we tried a whole bunch of other shirts. I have some, some really great ideas for shirts, but they all keep getting um, kicked back because of copyright. And so we, we basically, I don't, I feel like it's not really copyright violation because it's, it's a play on that. It's a, it's a twist on different shirts that existed already. I don't know. Um, anyway, I, I have, I kind of wish that they could exist because every time we try to present them to one of these uh, stores, they kick it back immediately and say, no, that looks like dead Led Zeppelin, or that looks like Iron Maiden, or that looks like this company or this band or whatever. So we have a lot of ideas that we haven't been able to get printed. <laughs> Uh, and I don't want to do my own printing. And yes, I know about Redbubble because Redbubble would probably print anything. Um, but part of our problem is we have so many, like we don't want five stores. So how do we keep it, co the complexity down? How do we do it all in one place? So Keytars, there you go. Eric knows what I'm talking about. Um, best meal to program on? Ooh, that's a topic that I haven't had before. Um, a steady diet of pepperoni pizza maybe would be the best meal to program on. The problem is you're going to have to keep eating it because every two hours you're going to want to take a nap after that piece of pizza. So, it's so brilly. So brilly. I like it. Yeah, Metalhead. Um, I, I have a lot of metal bands that uh, I'm, I, I don't listen to a lot of new metal. I, I just like, I I don't know. I guess I guess that's the definition of getting old, right? Is you stop you stop finding all the new music you used to find. Um, but I love how many '80s metal or hard rock bands are still around. Um, the sad part is, is like I'm a big fan of Tool. If we're going to talk about music for a second, Tool's one of my favorite all time bands. It was actually the defining moment in knowing that I was going to marry my wife is when I played her Tool for the first time. She had never heard it, and I played it, and she loved it, and I knew then that we were going to get married. Um, but Tool is one of those bands that it turns out uh, Maynard, the lead singer, was actually on an interview and said that they don't get new fans, that they only have their old fans. And so any new music they they have, it's like a diminishing return over time because new generations have not gone back to metal or I don't even sometimes I don't even consider them metal. I don't even know. Tool is an enigma. Like they don't their formula is not the same every time. So if you haven't if you're into that music, you probably have heard of Tool. If you haven't heard of Tool, I feel like everybody deserves just a, a nice little listen of a couple of their songs. If you love complex music that um, has all of the fancy words in it, like syncopation and, you know, fancy bars and measures and all those things, then you will love Tool because they're, that's the, the, the complexity of their music is such that I can't, as a, as a former musician, I can't even figure it out sometimes. I can't figure out what they're doing. So... <laughs> Please ignore my name. This is the right time to start in DevOps. It's always the right time to start in DevOps. Um, there are already, every career in tech is, I think, up and to the right. So uh, we talk about AI sometimes because this is the thing on the headlines of, you know, AI doesn't, means that some jobs will be removed, but I don't, I don't think there's a, there's a real particular job in tech that is suddenly going to be removed from the existence on the planet by AI, at least not in the next five or 10 years. Um, any, anything out f farther than five to 10 years, and it's hard to imagine what, I think the things that we're going to be using AI for in 10 years, we probably haven't even thought of yet. So it's going to be hard to figure that one out. But yes, DevOps, absolutely. The reality is DevOps are closely aligned with software programmers, and DevOps has to do a lot of interpretive work. So in other words, you have to look at different requirements that are sometimes completely unique to the business. 
oh, well, we have stuff on AWS and we have stuff on Azure and we have these things that are IoT and we have some data center stuff and we need to connect this to that and we need low latency and we need this thing to have a memory cache. And your your art form as DevOps is helping automate infrastructure, helping automate code. And you can use absolutely AI to do that. You can help, AI can help you. But I think it's gonna be a very long time before I can give a list of requirements and have all these disparate systems and programming languages and whatnot, and actually have AI spit out all the repos, all the YAML files, all the Docker files, all the everything I need in a way that an expert doesn't have to review it, right? That 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 future is, well, first we have to solve the hallucination problem, which even Google can't figure out yet. So nobody, Microsoft, nobody's been able to solve the hallucination problem. And until we stop the hallucination problem, in my mind, we can't really depend on um, or AI without engineer review for the foreseeable future. Now, maybe that day is tomorrow when we figure that problem out, but um, I am pro AI. I'm on team pro AI, but with a human manager, because I, I think for the foreseeable future, we still need a lot of human oversight. Um, I don't know why I went on the music rant that turned into an AI rant, but um, Naughty Bot, I hear you. Um, yes. And you can get my courses below. They, they do not start, just so you know, they do not start with day one DevOps. What I focus on in this channel is the infrastructure of cloud native and containers. So we focus on the DevOps world, but specifically the area of modern infrastructure design, modern infrastructure management. So yeah, hang around. Um, I have a blog post, by the way. Actually, it's not even a blog post. It's a GitHub show slash DevOps. So I have this post that should probably turn into an actual blog post someday or a resource. Anyway, I had to sneeze. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of answers in there. Feel free to put stuff in there if someone's interested in their own. You want to put your own opinions in there. It's a discussion around, you know, whether or not you're a developer. This, I know the title of this post is I'm a developer, but um, it basically, I should probably change it to say I'm in tech. <laughs> I have a job in tech. How do I get into DevOps? I think DevOps is like all programming jobs, it's a little weird to step into that job. DevOps it typically implies as a DevOps role, it means that you need to know a little bit about a lot of different areas. And so you need to know a little bit about infrastructure, you need to know a little bit about cloud, you need to know a little bit about programming. You don't have to be a full-time programmer to start, but you need to understand how programs are installed, how their dependencies are installed, how they're managed. Um, what's the life cycle of an app? How do we do pull requests in GitHub? Th these are all developer specific concepts, but then you also need to know networking and distributed computing. And so there's a lot of things you need to know, but you don't always, for a junior DevOps person, you don't have to go super deep. You don't have to know what MTU is on a TCP packet to understand DevOps, but it does, all those things help. It does help the more you learn about each vertical, as we call them, verticals. So you got you know, learn Python, learn Terraform, learn AWS, learn Docker. These are all verticals. And to me, a DevOps person is what I would call a virtualist. And this was a phrase coined like 20 years ago by someone, and I forget who they were. Um, I, I, I do know where I, I heard it. It was at a, a Mark uh, Mansati, I think is how you say his name. Mark Manassi, Mark Manassi conference. Um, and he's a a guy that's been in tech longer than me and used to have his own conferences. I don't know if there's anyone in chat that knows, remembers Mark, um, why am I mispronouncing his last name? Um, but at Mark's conference, someone defined gener a generalist is more like your help desk, right? So a help desk person who's a generalist means they know the surface area of a, a, a thousand things, but it, they don't really go super deep in any one thing because they can't, because they're thrown problems all the time on the phone or an email or whatever as a help desk person. And then there is a specialist and a specialist might be a Golang programmer or a Python programmer. And they spend 98% of their day in Python programming, you know, writing code, solving business problems with code. And then in the middle 
he that person that was giving that talk was sort of saying that the future is for virtualists and that that's someone who's both a specialist and a generalist and i love this term i use it to this day as if it's my own but the idea there is that you start as a generalist because that's how we kind of all need to start um, it's hard to get a, a landscape for the entire industry and understand everything by just learning one thing only. If you only learn to po program Python and you never learned about networking, it would be very hard in that career because you only know that one thing. So a virtualist is someone who might start as a generalist and then decides to narrow the scope of their focus and they go deep on, you know, let's say a dozen topics. They start with one. They build to two, they build to three topics where they become a specialist in each one of them, but they still maintain that generalist approach. That becomes what he called a virtualist. And that he, he said was like, this was before we had cloud. This was um, back when we were doing virtualization. Virtualization was a new thing. VMware was a new idea. And the idea was is that open source and the world and the internet was making it so that we we didn't have to be a specialist because the internet could help us. This was actually like, I think this was, this was so early on. This was maybe within the first 10 years of Google existing. Um, I think we barely had YouTube when I went to this conference. And so the idea was we were starting to be able to learn things online and find answers online. So we didn't necessarily always have to know everything to its deepest extent, but that a generalist is too easy to replace. Like a generalist... You know, help desk are typically the lowest paid people. So um, you need, in order to, you know, to move up in your career, the quick big question was, should I specialize in this one thing? And I've seen people do that. And in, in fact, in part of my career, I specialized on Microsoft System Center, which was technically like a dozen apps. <laughs> but um, I specialized on very specific infrastructure tooling for a couple of years. And I and I ended up becoming like a specialist. I, I like didn't see everything else. I wasn't paying attention to Linux at all for a, a period of time. Um, I was only focused on Windows Server and these tools. And that was fun. But eventually I got bored because I was only focused on these one these few things. And so I wanted to learn other stuff and try other stuff. Um, I've also started my, I started my career at Help Desk. So I was a generalist to start with. And that's, and I worked my way up through to like sysadmin, you know, server admin, all those roles and uh, did that, that path. So welcome, glad you're here. Big history buff asks. <laughs> Seven's like, yeah, System Center. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Didn't mean to give you. A, I don't know if that's if that's a bad story for you, but yeah, System Center. Spent many years on System Center, probably more than I should have. I even went to System Center conferences because um, I loved infrastructure, and I and I happened to work in a Microsoft shop for five years. So, uh, Big History Buff says, would you always put a proxy in front of a node? of in node Docker Swarm. Um, I think that anytime you're using orchestration, you're gonna end up needing some sort of proxy. Um, first off, Nginx you typically want a proxy in front of for static assets. Not always, but it helps. Um, since Nginx, sorry, did I say Nginx? I mean node. In node, you know, inherently node by default is gonna be single threaded. Um, so in traditional node, we usually use the proxy in front of it to offload some of the processing for static images or other assets, CSS, JavaScript, so that node itself could be reserved. Those threads could be reserved, even though they're very, very fast, right? Uh, those single threaded workloads could be focused on the application itself. So that's when I started using proxies was just on the front end of all my Node.js apps. Back when I was helping with PHP, this was a, over a decade ago. We were doing PHP stuff, and we, we were starting to use Nginx and Apache. Well, we were using Nginx as a, pro a proxy and a web server in front of PHP because, one, PHP needed the web server, but, two, we wanted the advantage of that pull-through proxy. So we would we would actually enable the caching in that proxy so that um, it, would prox it would proxy the static assets from PHP as well. So we did a lot of that. Um, but nowadays, every cluster I see has at least some proxies in it. Most of the time, the reason we need it now, the real reason we need those now is not for your, not necessarily for your advanced application functionality or necessarily for 
high performance or peak performance. We need the proxies because we're now in container land. We can run 100 containers that all run websites on the same server with a single IP address. So the problem with that is we now need to we now need the proxy to properly receive the connections on port 80 and 443 and then route the traffic to the proper container inside that host or inside that cluster. To me, that's the real reason why every Kubernetes cluster, every Swarm cluster is going to need some sort of proxy. Now, if you're on the cloud, you have an opportunity to outsource that proxy to outside the cluster. You might use an ALB, an ELB, um, any, any type of load balancer. That's a service. That's still a proxy. You're just choosing to have that outside the cluster. So I don't really have an opinion on whether it's inside your cluster or outside the cluster. It's really up to you and your architecture design. Um, there are pros and cons to both. I love using proxies that are just given to me as a service because I don't have to monitor it. I don't have to update it. I, I can just let it go. But obviously those things cost money usually, and they're different on every cloud. Every hosting solution has a different proxy. So then I have to, I have to, I can't just generalize it and make it something like traffic or Nginx or HA proxy. I have to, you know, I have to use their specific language in my infrastructure code. And if I'm doing across multiple clouds, now I have to have different setups. So in Kubernetes, I do like using the ingress. I like using either contour or uh, traffic. Those are probably my two go-tos, contour and traffic. I like to use those in Kubernetes by default as my ingress provider, which is technically going to be my all incoming HTTP connections will go through that ingress. And then we've got this new gateway protocol that is coming out in Kubernetes that will allow me to then do fancy things like say, hey, this part of the URL path can be controlled by that dev team in Kubernetes. And this part of the path or this set of URLs can only be controlled by that team of devs. And the slash blog can be controlled by the marketing team, right? But no one and no one else can muck with slash blog. That has to, and that's what the gateway protocol is going to give us that we can actually put permissions and rules around who can control URLs. And that's actually I think that's a really helpful thing for growing teams. You don't need that at first. You don't need that if you're just like a team of three. But as you get multi-team Kubernetes clusters where different teams are all pushing, you know, they're updating YAML and code is getting deployed to the same cluster. You're going to eventually care about um, something like the gateway API or something advanced with ingress to make sure they don't accidentally step on each other's toes and break someone else's URLs because they did an improper regex or something like that. And that, that can happen. So hopefully that helps big history. Um, and Kit, sorry, I missed your question there. Um, I've been working in Kubernetes for some time now. However, I do not score good on the practice exams for CKAD. How do I test my knowledge in order to clear the cert apart from the practice papers? Um, I'm assuming you know about Killer Coda. Uh, so besides the practice papers, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're Googling and you're just looking at everything out there for all the different things you need to practice. But... If you haven't heard about this one, this one, um, what'd you say? You were on CKAD, right? Yeah. So if you go over here, a lot of it is around the command line. So coming soon, coming soon, coming soon. <laughs> so uh, try this stuff out. Like I think really honestly to me, repetition is the secret sauce. If I... If I actually have to take a, a real thing, like a real problem, and solve it with Kubernetes, and I, instead of just theory, I don't do well on test if I just had to study the theory. I have to have a natural desire to want to know all those things about it, and I have to be able to practice those things with real, real apps that I can put up on a real server and show to the world, you know, or at least write about it in a blog article. So one of the things I recommend you do is you yourself start teaching what you're learning. And what I mean by that is create your own blog. 
you can do it free. You can do it on GitHub as just a bunch of markdown files in GitHub. Um, start writing down what you're learning. Take copious notes, but then write it as if you're teaching others. So take, let's say, one of the, um, let's just take a topic. And someone else in chat, let me know if I'm off base or if you like this idea. So take, let's say, cube, cube control context. So you should know that command line well, that cube control command line. You should know some of the options, and you definitely should know the documentation site. Like you really need to spend a lot of time reading um, Kubernetes.io and maybe just make that your, your reading material like a novel. Um, hopefully you'll retain some of the knowledge, but you should definitely be at least skimming a lot of the pages on the website and understanding how the website works so that you can find answers quickly in Kubernetes' documentation. Um, and then over here, um, let's just say that on this particular topic, imagine you're writing a three-part blog post on how to teach someone ab all about contexts. In the in so there's something about um, the act of trying to teach. If you're trying to convey information to others, you have to really think about it much deeper than just using the technology because you have to explain it. So you have to think of it in different ways. You have to think about how is it a, how do I approach this as if I'm brand new? Because um, once you've learned the knowledge, you're no longer brand new, and you have you have to just pretend to understand what it's like to be someone who's brand new. So often for me, the hardest thing about teaching is that I realize I don't know my content well enough to teach it. I know well I know it well enough to use it, but I don't know it well enough to teach it, especially if you're on a live show. <laughs> So if you are willing, what if you just get on the internet and you start helping other people answer their questions? If you go to forums, if you go into the Kubernetes Slack, if you go into Stack Overflow, and you find other people's questions about Kubernetes, specifically on the topic you're studying. So if you go through the syllabus of what you need to know for ZKAD, and then you just, let's say you're focusing on that one thing, maybe it's just pods, right? or the kube control run command, or whatever the topic might be. You're going to go somewhere on the internet, and you're going to find everyone who's talking about that, see if you can help them. In the act of trying to help them, and that might be writing a blog post, that might be going and hunting down the answer, you're going to get, hopefully, if you're anything like me, you're going to get a little bit of satisfaction of knowing that you're trying to help people. And the act of doing that means that you're not going to want to be wrong, so you're going to maybe want to know a little more. You're going to be interested more because you might actually be able to help someone. And of course, we all love helping people. So um, for me, I have to I have to put myself into it and not just learning it on my own for my own use. It has to be something that I'm willing to teach. I have to be. I want to have to share it. Um, I don't take a lot of certifications anymore. I have over once I got to thirty certifications, I kind of stopped taking them. But when I would study, I would actually start doing like lunch and learns about what I was studying. So I had to teach my coworkers what I was learning. Um, back then it was just blog posts. This was, you know, most of my tests were in the nineties and the two thousands. So, um, so I would teach people through blog. We didn't even call it blogs back then. It was just web articles or my web log. Um, and that's how I would teach. And, and by teaching, I would learn so much more than what I thought I needed to know to do. So I don't know if that helps you. I don't know if that's anyone else has done that, but that's how I learned for studying for certifications. Um, so yeah, on the, on the sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling back up in the chat there. <laughs> uh, I'm just realizing Tommy said, sit your children down with undertow yesterday, <laughs> or sat the children down with undertow yesterday. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, I wish I could play undertow on this video, but uh, for people to enjoy uh, one of the absolute best songs uh, of rock of all time. Um, all music sucks after the five years past your graduation date. Um, so... So for the career advice, I mean, getting into DevOps, uh, I would try to get a job around DevOps. So if you're brand new to tech, you're gonna, you know, and you don't have a university degree in tech, then the first step is you're gonna have to get a lot of learning in and a lot of certifications. 
So I know multiple people, including myself, but others that in the last decade, they went and they basically needed to get a job in tech, in tech, but they didn't necessarily have the expertise to be a DevOps hire or a developer hire. So they would get a job, the closest job they could get to those teams. It might be writing documentation. It might, um, I know people like that, that their entry, uh, before they were coders, their entry into tech was to write documentation or to use some other skill that they maybe have gotten to get into tech. Maybe it's um, tech support or phone support or help desk or you know PC repair. I, I don't care. The point is, is that you're, you've got to work your way in because you're never going to go from, I have no certifications, no university, I have zero experience, and someone's going to hire me as a junior DevOps. That's that I just don't believe that's going to happen. So your in is usually going to be adjacent experience or experience that's semi-related to the industry and then a, a substantial amount of certifications. So you're going to have to go and you have to take a lot of courses. Like my courses below are designed for people new to containers, but it's not people new to tech or new to new to Linux, like there's actually on my, my Docker mastery course, which starts you off with the very basics of containers, teaches you Docker and Kubernetes. It assumes, you know, Linux and TCP IP and servers and the cloud, because one course can't teach you all those things. So you're going to need to get courses. Udemy is a very fast and cheap way, relatively cheap, but cheaper than a lot of the others way for get to get a lot of those courses. There's Linux courses, and so you're going to have to build up your knowledge. And then as you're building up that knowledge, you're going to go need to take certifications. The key certifications for you, we talked about earlier. If you just scroll up and chat, um, we talked about this. So in there is a list. And you can go back in this show. And in, earlier in this show, we talked about getting into DevOps in the career. And you're going to want to get a cloud certification or a couple you're going to want to get a Linux certification, and you're going to want to get a networking certification. So those are the three areas. How do computers talk? How do computers work, specifically Linux? And how does the cloud work? And so you're going to want to start working on those three pillars. And then you're going to try to get very basic intro jobs in tech. I, I, don't, know, I don't really know any other way to do it. You can try to go to an accelerator or one of these programs that will help place you where you you take the, but those are those can be really expensive so i don't assume that you have you know $10,000 or whatever you need to get into one of those those uh, accelerators those work for some people but especially if you have to work at night or some of them require you to work all day and you have to be available to do it all day it just it's hard not knowing all of your scenario but um, you're I, what i've seen work multiple times including myself is you get a very junior do job in IT that's not devops but you're going, once your employer, who has maybe a DevOps team, sees you and you and you become the person to go to. If you start to ask for more work, ask what else you can do, um, you know, you are a voracious learner and you share constantly. You're always wanting to share what you know. You're excited about tech. And I know a guy who did that, and he's a good friend of mine now. <laughs> uh, he's even been on this show multiple times. His name's Kevin Griffin. And he started in tech at Help Desk. Now he runs his own development consulting business and has been running the longest running meetup and conference in Virginia Beach. Like he does all these things now, but people forget that almost 20 years ago, he was a help, he was an outsourced help desk guy for a city government running around fixing PCs for a living. But on the side, he was learning software development. He was slowly building up his skills. And over years, he eventually left that job, got a, a got a more developer focused job, and just got better and better and better. And now he's got a whole career. He's got staff. He's got a team. I mean, it's just great. It's great. He's got a team of people. He's a great guy. And the the key traits was he he loved tech. He was super excited about it, and he was sharing everything he learned constantly at the job, uh, at meetups. He was always applying to try to talk to meetups. He made his own meetup when there was no meetup for .NET back in the 2000s because he just wanted to share what he knew. And then that people liked him and wanted to learn from him and wanted to teach him. And I was one of those people. I had been in tech for 
when I first met him, I'd been in tech like 10 years. And I saw that glimmer and spark in his eye. I could see that he was the guy that would take the hard problems when no one else will. He was the guy who wanted to stay a little late when he had time to work on something that, or to learn from me. I was working on something that he knew nothing about. So he would sit there with me and learn with me. We would have conversations in the hallway. Everyone else wasn't wasn't as passionate as he was. He was a distinctly different human being. Um, and he just couldn't help learning and he always wanted to help others. So you knew you could count on him. If, he ne- if you needed help and you thought he might be able to help, he was always there for you. Um, that kind of person is going to have a job in tech. Um, and there, cause there are so many people in tech that aren't wanting to help you and are too busy to be bothered and are too busy to share their information. Um, and nowadays we don't have, a lot of us just don't have time for that. A lot of the people that I know that are hiring individuals, um, they want go getters because they, they have people that have knowledge, but maybe they're, maybe they don't share a lot. Maybe they don't make great documentation and they don't. They're not willing to change their ways or learn new things, and they just are happy where they're at. And that's there are jobs for that, but there's always, I think, more jobs available for those that are proactive, always learning, and always sharing what they're learning. So, um, what about a Linux system administrator? Sure, that's a fine job. That's a great job. I know lots of people that got their start. Um, I know a couple of people actually, because we have a local cloud hoster and a couple of people used to work there that their only job was working at a cloud company that, that is kind of like Bluehost where they, they run websites, a lot, a lot of websites. And so they got into help desk as someone who helped other people with their broken websites like Squarespace or Bluehost or one of these places that host websites. And they, they learned more about Linux while they're in their job. Then they went and they took a Linux course. They got Linux, Linux certified. I think they got other certifications like networking, security, or something. And then their next job was actual sysadmin at the same company. They, I think they got a, a sysadmin job. And so they weren't on help desk anymore. They were actually managing the servers. And then eventually they, learned, they moved to a team that was doing more de- – they moved to a different company that was doing more DevOps stuff and more – agile development practices and they wanted to be on the sysadmin side so they kind of ended up being in devops because they knew they they worked at a company that was full of software developers but they were doing sysadmin and they were doing linux stuff help desk stuff and they kept working you know it took years right they worked their way up the ranks and um now they're a devops professional so that's one path i've seen done several times to get into the career Here's an interesting question. Um, I'm currently in the process of opening sourcing a large repo. Have you worked with people converting Azure pipelines to GitHub Actions? I see an Actions importer suggested. Is that good? Yeah, I know exactly. They've got several new importers for GitHub Actions. I have not tried it, and I would love, I would love to like connect with you on that. Um, that's a cue, Martin. Hit me up on Discord, on in the in the server because um, I am very curious about those importers. Importers can be one of those things where like they're either very useful or they're garbage, and that you spend more time fixing it, fixing what it created, than you did just natively doing it. Um, by the way, that's kind of like my experience right now when I use Chat GPT for GitHub Actions. Is it will make a, a a GitHub action, but a lot of times what that GitHub action is is a bunch of shell commands. <laughs> It's not using like a bunch of other actions. It's just running shell scripts and or shell commands. And that's not like I want to use other people's work. That's to me, GitHub Actions is all about using the marketplace to build your work on top of other people's existing work in open source. Um, I don't if everything could just if everything was going to be a shell script, I would just use drone or some other simpler, you know, tool. So to me, GitHub Actions is about finding all the stuff in the marketplace. And right now, ChatGPT, at least a month ago. ChatGPT wasn't great for that. Uh, it, it might produce output that is usable, but it's way too many shell scripts and manual commands and stuff like that. Um, so I'm actually very interested if an importer 
would correctly find popular official, for example, if it's going to build an image, is it just going to blindly take your shell script and turn it into a shell script in an action? Or is it going to go, oh, no, we should use the official Docker Docker uh, action to build your image now. I got a feeling it's not going to do that, and it's going to suck. That's my that's my gut feeling. But I'd love to see what you do with it. Um, if you want to share the repo with me privately, or if you want to get on a on a Discord hangout, I'd love to look at that. Um, <laughs> Huston's here, uh, two forty five a.m. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, Hassan or Hassan, I'm I've tried it both ways. I'm not sure what's the correct one. Chat GPT was surprisingly good from what I saw. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Azure pipelines. Um, yeah, so that's part of the problem is if your if your old uh, if your old CI solution is mostly shell scripts, which is what like back when I was using Jenkins, that's what it was a lot of times was it would you know like you would install a command line tool that's available on the node and then you would wrap that command line tool in a bunch of shell scripts. So, and then eventually we got better declarative tools and we were trying to write um, better descriptive, what's that tool for Jenkins? Like Genie or, I can't remember. Anyway, um, see, I've purged all that information. I'm no longer a Jenkins person. Um, but we did all that. And, the, and the, the problem was, is I got a feeling if I tried to import that into GitHub Actions, it, it just wouldn't translate. Because really what, what I want my actions to be is, um, I'm using this official, action from someone. I'm using this official action from GitHub, this one from Docker, this one from Trivi, this one from the Ansible project, whatever. And then I'm using this third party one from that's really popular and it has a hundred stars to automatically make a comment in my pull request. You know, someone like Peter Evans who has a lot of popular uh, GitHub actions. And what I don't want is like a handwritten script that uses the GitHub API to make a comment like I don't want to maintain a bunch of JavaScript and shell script when someone else can, which is essentially what Actions Marketplace is. It's, it's outsourcing the effort of, of maintaining in that and making sure it works. So yeah, um, I haven't actually been on a project. I have worked with teams on working. We moved away from Drone to GitHub Actions and from Jenkins to GitHub Actions at the same time in a big team. But it was this was years ago. This is like 2001, and we did it before we had the importer, so it was all manual, and and we were creating artisanal. We were actually we were honestly also doing reusable actions when they were brand new. So one of the things is a lot of this stuff can be reusable. So we were always trying to break up our components into reusable actions, so that okay, this is a Docker build. Okay, this is a container scan. Okay, so this is a Kubernetes smoke test on a K3S cluster. Um, this one is creating an SBOM, you know, and so and and you know this one is linting, and we would make those all reusable, and then we would pull those into other repos for how we wanted to use them. This is something I teach in my GitHub Actions course. Um, link below. So when we do that, th the importers probably aren't going to make them reusable <laughs> because it it means you have to write in, uh, you have to write inputs and it gets complex. So I have a feeling that I'm not sure if the importers would make it harder or easier. Maybe maybe it's simply see the problem is is if I make an import, it's not going to be what I want, and then I'm going to end up having to translate that into a whole new repo that's different files. And the question is, do the files that I it created for the import even work, or should I just throw them away and just look at the source, interpret what the source pipelines were trying to do, and then just handwrite my own reusable workflow. It's a real, I have. I do not have an answer to this question. So I'd love to see what you're doing with it because I'd like to help others about using GitHub Actions, my favorite CI. So. Uh, Thomas, that's an interesting question. So the trend of migrating back to on-prem. So uh, no, I do not think for many, many people it makes sense to go back to on-prem. One, because I think a lot of us no longer have the hardware skills we think we used we think we think we have. Like, have you ever tried to dynamically provision on-prem hardware 
with a centralized configuration and OS management tool. Um, if not, that is a thing that you'll probably need to know, even if you just have 12 servers, because with 12 servers, that means you're probably replacing st- something every year, at least. And now you've got to worry about, you know, you've got to worry about BIOS management and um, remote virtual uh, KVMs. I mean, there's all these factors. You have to worry about network switching and router upgrades and security patches for your routers and firewalls. And so the reality is, is that teams that already have that staff in house and already have that expertise, it's a lot less costly for them to order a server or two in order to save money on cloud hosting by using people versus cloud. Because to me, it's a, it's a pendulum. On one side, you have a lot of people and you don't have cloud. The cloud is meant to outsource all the low layers. And of course, it's going to cost more than your own hardware because it takes a lot of people to run that, to monitor that, to ensure the uptime, to have redundant internet connections with backup failover bandwidth. And, and you know, um, it's. I used to do all that work and I don't miss it. I love it. But when you're responsible for the whole stack, it's kind of nice to not have to worry about hardware outages in a data center that I have to drive an hour to when that's not my primary job and I don't live in the data center. So I have to, when there's an outage, it's a big deal. And then I have to spend my whole day there and I, and the, and then I have to go and ma- you know, get mail order hardware because three hard drives failed in the, in a matter of a week. So then my rage set went down. Like these are the, this is the reality of running your own hardware. And I have lost all those skills because I haven't used them in a decade. Like I think the last time I stepped into a co-location data center to work on a customer's hardware was probably 2016. So I even still have, I think I even still have the badge to the, to the co-location center. I don't think it works because I'm not, I'm not with that client anymore, but I had the key, I had the key fob and the badge and for some reason they never took them back. Um, so I am skeptical. Now, if you see teams like the team over at um, Basecamp and companies like that that are like, we're gonna we're gonna bring our app to our in in house data center. My presumption is that they already have a lot of extra time in their engineers. They already have all the good people to do the work, and they must be using a lot of services in the in the cloud that they know so well that it's not going to be a big deal to run it on-prem. If you're someone who's running RDS in the cloud for your databases on AWS, and you're going to think that you're going to switch all that with the same level of effort and staff you have now, if you're going to switch that to your own data center, you have a big surprise coming because running your own highly redundant, monitored, fault-tolerant, always backed up, easy to restore with tested restores of a bunch of different databases, like doing all that in your own data center, that's a lot of work. That's dedicated staff. I used to work with a team that had, we had three SQL admins. That was their job. And then I had a dedicated storage admin that worked for me. And her only job was to manage the disks for the servers. And and it wasn't that huge of a, a data center. We had maybe 300 servers, um, physical servers. But in that 300 physical servers, I had a team of 12 that managed hardware, oper- you know, data center operations, um, physical hard, uh, storage. We had a big SAN. Um, and it, there was a lot. There was a lot of complexity. So is it costing a company extra hundred, a couple extra hundred thousand dollars to outsource that to the cloud? Absolutely. Um, but um, to answer your question in a very much shorter way, it's a pendulum, and I see this has been happening since the dawn of AWS. Is people are excited about AWS, they go to AWS or Azure or Google, and they go all in, and then they realize at some point that they have so much infrastructure that they don't like the cost of the bill. So then they have to go start a new team, ramp up a new team of people that are going to be the cloud team. They're going to make an internal cloud, and they're going and they have to hire the right people, and they have to find a data center, and they do all this. And then they look at their math and they claim that there's benefits. There's performance benefits, cost benefits. I'm always skeptical of that if you're doing it correctly. Because what I th- sometimes I see people doing is you, you replace the amazing ability for a cloud to take all that infrastructure, 
the SQL servers, the S3 storage, the backups, the the um, the networking, the the DDoS protection, like all of the things that you're using in that cloud, and they're doing it at a level of like five nine uptime, right? Like they're doing it at an amazing secure level compared to a team of five or ten people that you have in house that are somehow supposed to replicate that level of service and expertise. I think it's not often done well. And I think the companies that claim benefits, like if they're claiming millions of dollars saved, um, I bet they're I bet they're not monitoring as well. I bet you their backups aren't gonna be restored as fast. I bet you they haven't done as much security pen testing as the cloud does. I bet you they don't have dedicated red and blue teams for security. I bet you they don't have the kind of security response turnaround for a new hardware failure that uh, hardware security vulnerability that requires OS and BIOS patches across the entire infrastructure. If they haven't done all that, then they're cheating because you're now comparing this amazing thing that the cloud does for us with a fraction of that functionality and and service level in a small team, in a data center, you know, in one or two data centers versus a global entity. So I am always very skeptical of it. I don't know any team that I've worked with that has moved off cloud well. <laughs> um, they usually try some things and then realize that, yeah, the it's much harder on-prem than they anticipated to do all the things that they were doing in the cloud. Um, they have to hire people that are like Ceph engineers or you know storage engineers because that, that storage on the internet's kind of a solved problem. That's why we have object storage and uh, block storage and replicated storage and NFS and all these different types of iSCSI. And then they realize that they need all that in their data center. And even if they only have 100 servers, they probably need that. Um, and then they have to hire all these people that are expensive, really expensive. So, yeah. <laughs> Basecamp will allow their $88,000 Datadog account to expire. They're cutting the fat. Um, yeah. Oh, you have a problem that when have a problem that half the internet is running on AWS and Azure monopolies. Well, we live in a world of tech monopolies, so um, I I don't know. The only way I know how to fix that is to not use them. So if you're not willing to not use them, then I mean the, the monopolies become monopolies because we all use them. I do a lot of my own stuff on DigitalOcean. I'm a big fan of DigitalOcean. I uh, love their simplicity and they keep adding more advanced functionality. We got VPCs now. Um, you know, they've got, they do a lot, of, they do hosted Kubernetes, they do hosted S3 equivalent. Uh, they have hosted load balancers. They have a lot of the things. They have hosted databases now. Um, and so I like them because they're small, they're independent. Uh, I've been to their, I've been to one of their main offices in New York City. They're nice people. Um, but, I have also heard horror stories about their lack of ability to respond to big outages for big companies that their entire revenue depends on. This platform must be available and we need immediate res uh, support. And they don't historically, and I don't know if this is still true, so I'm not gonna badmouth DigitalOcean, but historically, they have not had the high-end level service contracts like the Azures and AWSs where you have like a dedicated account rep and you have technical people like a TAM that you can reach out to in a moment's notice when you have infrastructure or concerns about something and you can get a team to help you within a day or two notice for a, a major issue. I mean, usually I know when, when I was working, we were working on Azure, we had a four hour response of what we considered a senior engineers. So we could get someone on the horn immediately, but if we, ha if we needed like tier three level support, uh, we could have that in less than four hours. Um, I, I think there might even have been a higher option of like 60 minutes, but we I don't we didn't pay for that. We were paying lots of money for that. And I don't know if DigitalOcean supports that. So one of the things that you, you know, I'm all about supporting the little people. 
Uh, I am, you know, I'm an ind independent content creator, so I'm I'm advocating for the use of not the, the monopolies. Um, but I'm also understanding that it's different strokes for different folks. Not everybody ha has the same needs. And Linode, like Conrad's uh, advocating for Linode. I, I have, I actually did a talk, a, 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 a live stream with Linode a couple years ago. I have not used them for any big projects, so I don't, I have not heard anything bad about them, but I don't use them myself, so I can't really vouch for them. But hey, I heard good things. Conrad likes them. Um, what I'm seeing, what I do like seeing now, especially in the EU, is that we're getting more clouds that are regional clouds. You know, I don't think that the world is served well by everyone putting their stuff in AWS. Um, you know, monopolies are bad in general. I agree. So I, I honestly don't prefer AWS by default. I look for opportunities to not use AWS, not because they're monopoly, it's just because they're, they're very complicated. So for a small team that's trying to stay nimble, they have a small project, I might lean them, you know, my, my, I, 10 years ago, what I would have done was go, what can I do to keep them from not being on Heroku? In other words, how can we design their solution so that it can be on Heroku so they don't have to worry about building servers, building images. They can just point it at a repo and it deploys it, you know? And so Heroku is not as popular nowadays, but we, what we have is we have a lot of other bespoke players that are showing up to do the same kind of things that Heroku was doing just in a different way. That's how we have, you know, we have all these static content providers. We have, uh, um, Cloudflare, um, you know, we have all these, uh, I should probably just have like a list. Like there's like the list of alternative clouds, right? Um, but I use Cloudflare a lot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're a small company anymore, but um, I like to use them just because I think they, they create relatively simple tooling to solve very specific problems. And whenever there's a problem that I wanna solve that they provide the tool for, I, 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 I look at their tool first before I'll try to find an AWS solution. Um, I will try to use DigitalOcean first because I find that it's more pleasant to use even than Cloudflare. Like it's just a beautiful interface. It, it's intuitive. I like their CLI. Um, so that's, I almost feel like that's me doing my part. I don't know if that matters. Um, so yeah, if you don't like the monopolies, I'm, I hear you and I don't really have an opinion on the price. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, I feel like it, the prices are nebulous because, you know, one place will charge you a lot. I mean, the, the, the big three clouds are very competitive on pricing, so it's hard to differentiate them between each other. Um, but also Backblaze has really cheap storage. So I keep some stuff on Backblaze because it is so doggone cheap and they they're incredibly public about their storage design and their storage platform. And I don't have issues with it. It works great. So I do stuff there. And I, I do, I mean, are they bespoke and small? I mean, they're certainly small in terms of AWS, but um, there's also a local cloud. There's also a local cloud hoster um, that I don't use just simply because I don't like their solutions as much and I don't like their interface. So I love to support local, but uh, you know, I'm not going to support local to the detriment of like a client's project, <laughs> which is what I feel like I would do sometimes over there. Um, but that's a great, a great conversation. I'm so glad you asked that question, uh, Thomas. That is a great conversation to have. Uh, and I don't think there is a right answer. I think that we all get sick with some tool at any point in time. Um, and I don't blame you for wanting to, you know, rage quit storage on AWS. Not that I'm putting words in your mouth, but you know, if, if someone was like, I'm fed up with the storage bill and let me see if I can't design a, a hybrid solution where I design an on-prem storage solution on, you know, NVMe with a, a few local caches and like it uses a, you know, you have a permanent connection to the cloud. So you have really low latency, like sub, sub to 10 millisecond latency. If you're smart enough and you can design that and you can figure out a way to keep the cost down because of expertise you have in the company, I'm all for it. I just typically find that people underestimate the complexity of doing stuff on their own. So 
I I love seeing bespoke little setups. In fact, um, there's you know there's a couple of reddits reddits out there for like uh, you know show me your server closet and stuff like that. I, I love those things uh, because it, it just shows the creative side of hardware. Like we're all we all have a creative approach to things, and so one person's one person's data closet is different than another person's data closet. One person's server rack design and the you know, the hot cold rows and how you even design a data center is totally different between data centers. Um, so there's a lot of art in a lot of this and I love it. I think that like, I haven't been to it, but there's a, there's an art um, gallery near me and I, I, w- I would absolutely go if they would do like uh, data center art, <laughs> if they would have, a, you know, cause they have to do, the, they do the traveling contemporary art shows that just, they over, take over the whole art museum and they do that, uh, this place called contemporary art. And uh, I would love, I would absolutely love to be a part of like a data center design one where they, they just bring in like part of a data center with like the, like the crappy data center where there's all the, the famous picture where there's like a thousand yellow wires hanging off the back. Uh, and you might've seen this if you've been around the internet long enough for a long time, it was like a internet meme of just like, it was just a, a wall of cables hanging over each other. And I remember that they were all yellow and that to me is art. <laughs> Like recreate that in the real world for um, an expo, and I'm all in. I'm I'm buying a ticket. I'm taking all my friends. So, all right. Um, tell me if you have any more questions. Uh, Thomas looks like he has one more, maybe, and we might start wrapping this up. I can feel. I've been on for two hours. I can feel my throat going. Oh man, you're asking all the big questions that are too hard to answer quickly. Uh, blocks blockchain distributed cloud cloud i am i am not a fan of blockchain i feel like blockchain every time i look into it it i I don't see i don't see actual product solutions that are better than today's solutions with blockchain i just don't um people talk about like software on the blockchain well we have git as a versioning system it's it's great we don't need to replace it with blockchain um so I don't I don't have an answer for you on does blockchain have anything to do with the cloud at all. I just I don't see it. We um, in my world, Git is my blockchain. Like everything I do is in Git. Infrastructure is code. Git ops code itself. My, my all of my documentation and slides now for my talks they're all in Git. So that's my versioning system. That is the way that I I track the history and the origin and the ledger. Essentially, um, that's how I do it. So, um, and how would you make it reliable and secure? I don't. I don't even know that I could fit that in a course. I would not want to be responsible for managing a team, building a data center for a company. Um, it's there's just so many vectors nowadays, and you know, setting up. It used to be twenty years ago we could set up a firewall. Uh, you know, fifteen years ago we would set up a firewall. Um, an IDS, uh, maybe even an IPS, we would set up, we'd have a security team of three people that would set up um, sniffers, essentially, right? Systems that are watching the switches, watching the routers, monitoring on the hosts, and, you know, doing very low-level security stuff. And th- that, to me, isn't even as advanced as what you would need nowadays for plugging a data center into the internet. So I I don't even know. I have not helped ever build a data center, even though I technically did for two years, help the Navy. Um, I was running a security team that was installing firewalls for Navy data centers that were new, but I was just an implementer. I didn't design it. I didn't, I, there was an entire building full of people that were designing how this infrastructure was going to work together. And that was in 2002. So um, we were building data I- the internet data centers for the military. And it wasn't anything really military about it. It was just a government data center in a regular place. But, um, you know, I used all the same firewalls and all the same infrastructure. And it was incredibly complex. There'd be like sometimes 50 people all building at the same time in the physical data center. Like there was people over there working on servers. Those people were working on switches. We had our hardware people. We had our, our data, our fiber optic people that were making sure that the fiber optics got from the storage over to the fiber channel cards and the servers. Like there was so many people involved with just building out a data center with a thousand servers. 
Uh, it was not even, they weren't even that big back then, 500 servers, 1,000 servers. But there was so much expertise involved. I wouldn't even know how to do that today. It's just, it's so complex for the modern data center. Now, can you get a really cool piece of software, hardware? Like maybe this is my, you know, this right here. Um, let me just pull this up. This is like my favorite hardware that I don't know that I can ever afford. I've never seen it in the real world, but over at Oxide Computing, so oxide.computer, um, several people that are founders that I'm a huge fan of, um, several people from the industry came together from different backgrounds and they're building a data center hardware company called Oxide. And I love what they're doing. I love they're rethinking everything from the ground up. It's very like not the same as your typical Sun Micro, Dell, HP, whatever you want to buy. Um, it, it is highly integrated, but also heavily open sourced in terms of like, I think they're trying to like open source their BIOS. Um, and and a, I love their, of course, I just love the aesthetics. The design is beautiful. Um, <clears throat> but I'll put that in chat. So if you force me to build a data center today myself, I'm going to start with infrastructure, physical infrastructure. And the first thing I'm going to do is probably buy, um, if I if I can figure out how to buy it, I don't even know if they actually sell it yet. Uh, it's I think it's on a, still on a wait list. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to buy an Oxide computer rack and it's, I, I'm going to do that. <laughs> That's going to be my first thing. And, uh, and not go HP and Dell and sort of traditional route or, or not go bespoke and like, you know, build my own backblaze hardware storage design plus Sun Micro part systems like Google does. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go that route uh, unless they make me. So I would love to do, buy something like this. I don't know if they do storage. Well, they they have a storage one, so uh, maybe they just have a storage rack, and I can do all inclusive, open ZFS. That's cool, and then. And yeah, like I said, I've never seen this stuff in the wild. It's a pretty new company. They've been working on it uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, I think they, you know, they started, I think I've heard about them, I don't know, 2017, 2018. I can't remember when they first announced, but I've all, I've been waiting for them to like, hopefully sell some sort of home, like maybe a small des developer unit that's affordable, like maybe in the thousands of dollars, not, not tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, something that I can buy maybe and afford for a home, a home little data center. I'd love to do that. Um, because, you know, I mean, Raspberry Pis are cool and micro PCs are cool and I have those, but I, I'd, I would love to have, you know, right now my rack in the, uh, it's not really even a rack anymore. It's just a bunch of stuff stacked. It's kind of lazy. But mine is um, still writing on old Dell gear that's almost a decade old that I have Xeon processors in. But it still churns along. It still runs great. And, um, I, I, I don't have a reason yet for replacement, but it is starting to get slow, so I would love to change that out. Yeah. Yeah, those are interesting ideas. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Tommy is saying, if you're up to talk about the latest Docker desktop or play with Docker, I asked a couple of things at the top of the show. Did I miss it? Okay. Yeah, sorry I missed those. Um So uh, I did, all right, so what you want to do on, on for Docker Desktop is you want to go back a couple of weeks and um, let's see, go back into live on my channel. There will be a Docker Hub and desktop announcements. So that actually turned into a podcast that's highly edited and it talks just about, it's mostly about new features of Docker desktop, including new extensions. It's mostly about new extensions um, and new sort of partnerships that Docker's having. Docker's got this new thing called Scout that you should check out. I have also made a short on that. Um, one of the new shorts, we talked about a new feature in Docker desktop 118. And then I talk about a new feature in 119 that just came out called Docker Compose Sync. So those are all 60 second shorts you can go watch. Um, 
Docker Compose Sync is my favorite new thing of Compose. As you probably have heard me say, Compose is my number one dev tool. It's what I use every day. If I'm going to spin up anything for test or development, it's going to be in Compose. Um, because typically I, I, can, I need more than one container. Like a Docker run is great, but I typically need something else. I need a couple of things. I need a, a database or whatever. And Compose is just the best way to do that for me. So Compose now has this thing built in for sync, which means I don't have to bind mount in some cases. I don't have to bind mount my code and I can just, and we've had Mutagen and a lot of other Docker sync. There's the other tools that have existed, third-party tools. But what I'm talking about here is a built-in feature where you can just say Docker Compose watch and it will watch your uh, the directory. Basically you tell it where to watch and it will watch that and it will then, um, I actually have an example. Let me see if I can pull that up. It, it will uh, watch that directory and either one of two things will happen if a file changes. It will either rebuild the image and then restart the container from the new image automatically or it will just copy that file into your running container. The next step I want them to add, uh, it's, a, it's a wish list for them, is that if it sees, I want it to automatically restart the container if it copies a file in. That way I don't even need to run Nodemon. Nodemon would only be there if I needed to do advanced stuff that Nodemon maybe does that Docker wouldn't. But hey, if you're gonna copy a file in, then do a hup on the container to restart the application. Or if, you know, if you change the package JSON file or the requirements.txt pip file, then I want you to rebuild the image and then restart a new container and compose from that new image. That's all now called Docker Compose Sync. So you can check that out on my YouTube over here. Uh, that is also available in the Docker blog and that is available in the new version of Docker Desktop. So that is a teaser. But other than that, go check my recent podcast episodes or my live streams. You will see one that I had two people from Docker on the show and we went through a lot of that stuff. Play with Docker. I don't know about that Play with Docker has any new features. I don't know that it has anything new, so there's nothing to talk about there. Um, great question, Tommy. Thank you. Lee, what do you think about the level of knowledge that a dev DevOps needs to know about programming a language like Golang looking to build a K8s operator? So if you're building a K Kubernetes operator, you're going to need to program. Right, like even if it's, I mean, an operator could technically just be Bash. You could be really, really fancy with a bunch of command line tools, but you still got to know Bash programming. Like you, that's still a scripting language. Some might argue that you can make a whole program out of it, um, but you're going to need to know a language. GoLang is great. GoLang is the most popular language in cloud native when it comes to building the infrastructure that runs all of our stuff and all the tooling around Kubernetes. Docker is made with GoLang. Kubernetes is made with Golang. It's the default language. It is also, um, I think it's a relatively, I don't know, I'm not an expert in it, but it's a relatively easy language to learn in comparison to maybe, I don't know, I like it better than, I, li I find it easier to learn than, than maybe uh, C++, Java, and then Rust. I think it's easier to learn than Rust. I don't actually know Rust. Um, I have tried some demos and tried some things. I'm taking that advice based on several of my friends who do Rust. And due to the lack of, I think it's like garbage collection, memory management, stuff like that, that you maybe need to do more of hands holding in Rust. And maybe some of you in chat can tell me this. Um, I think that if you're new to programming, um, you can take three different approaches in my mind. If you're if you're infrastructure focused, you, you need to know bash shell scripts which ChatGPT is so helpful at helping. So I feel like everyone now can write shell scripts because we've got ChatGPT or whatever. Copilot for, Git, for um, GitHub, whatever your GPT or AI tool of choice for text generation, it probably can help you with bash scripts. It helps me every time. I don't even write a bash script now without GPT. Like I just won't do it. I won't if I don't have to, I won't have to. I will just type in a description of what I want it will give me something that maybe doesn't quite work, but I will. it'll get me close and then I'll iterate. And then I'll run it through shell check, which is a linter to make sure that I'm doing it correctly. Cause you can, you can sort of forget to escape things or uh, you know, quote things properly and shell check, uh, which, which is one of the tools that will check your shell code. Anyway, we all should know that. Like let's all agree if we can, that it's a universal language for Linux that works everywhere it works on Mac. Uh, now works on Linux or Windows with WSL2. 
You can use it to program a lot of things and control a lot of things. So if we all do that, the question is, what is a full-fledged language that someone who's in a typical DevOps or operational role might use? I think the number one answer to that is Python. I, however, don't write Python really, usually. I, when I come into a team, I rarely choose Python out of the gate. If it was today and I was writing infrastructure tooling like an operator, assuming I know Golang a little bit or I've at least taken some basic course on it, I would try to use Golang first. One of the big reasons for that is it's a compiled language. So just like Rust, C++, and some other languages, it doesn't need this heavyweight container. It doesn't need a bunch of heavyweight tooling in order for me to build it and ship it. It can be a single binary and I can, and even in one command, I can build it on multiple platforms. So it'll work, uh, it'll be a different binary, but I'll have one that will work on ARM, one that works on Intel and it all that's all built in. And it's a wonderful community of people that are willing to help you on the internet, right? So I love that. Python tends to be the default choice but Python is, uh, it, it's, com it's more complex for infrastructure because now you have to ship this big heavy container with a Python version. Even if you use the tools that wrap it up into an executable, it's in the background, it's really just untarring that thing and then running a, a, an embedded Python executable. Um, it tends to be a little slower at startup. And with infrastructure tooling, you want speed of startup is one of your major factors because you want things to be able to happen quickly in CI and CD and on your on your servers. You want things to happen quickly. So um, I wouldn't go Rust unless you knew why you needed to go Rust. My understanding is you'll probably it'll it'll require more effort to do the same level of thing. Um, if you can do it in GoLang, do it in GoLang. GoLang is really around networking, right? It's really good at designing uh, networked computing, and that's what we're talking about with Kubernetes. So why not go there? Uh, that was a that was a pun, wasn't it? Um, I am most fluent in Node.js. It's an interpreted language, and like I, I still get it. And TypeScript is a thing, but I feel like there's more complexity now to just getting started with that than there is with Go. Like I feel like you can take a Go course and you will learn enough with the standard libraries library to um, to get the job done with very little third-party stuff. I feel like with Node, um, one of the challenges about Node is that it's changed a lot over time, over its 15-year history. And we now have, you know, we have three different package manager options to choose from. For um, when you build it, you have, to, you have to figure out which base image, and that image is usually gonna come with lots of vulnerabilities. So then you have to worry about vulnerability management, dependencies and the speed of the dependencies is a thing. Like, installing node dependencies can be even its own performance problem. So there's, I feel like Node.js and its single threaded like lifestyle is like, it was designed for the years of 15 years ago. And where I look at Golang is very purpose fit. Um, it's built for cloud native distributed computing and it, it works well in teams and in open source and is well understood there. I mean, all these languages are extremely popular. So my opinions aren't the correct opinion, they're just an opinion. So um, if you asked me to come and help you and we both knew none of these languages, I'd say let's go both learn Golang and do it with a Go. That would be my choice. But if you told me we had to do it in Python, okay, fine, that's fine too. Python tends to be historically the most common DevOps language. Um, so, all right. Um, that's a great question. Conrad wants me to spend a bunch of money and buy hardware. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I will contact my budget team and told them that Conrad gave me permission. <laughs> you gave me permission to go buy a really fancy piece of hardware that I maybe don't need. By the way, there's a couple of other vendors out there that make these little micro machines that are designed for like home labs and stuff. And I love them. I love the idea, but the, man, they're so expensive. Like I know building it yourself isn't exactly cheap, um, but I, what I need is for someone to make, find me, and this is probably already exists, find me the best home micro, micro server hobby kit with all the parts and exactly how to build it in a way that it will hopefully 
either be close to fanless, which is I don't, that's not even possible in Intel, or super quiet, right? Because I'm in a studio, so I don't it can't be loud and have fans, right? And so a lot of servers, especially data center servers, are loud, and I and I just can't have that in here. So the one I have is is an actual server tower from. It's a micro tower from, I think it's HP. It might, it might be Dell. Actually, it's Dell. I get them confused. It's a Dell server. And uh, the one thing, my favorite feature is it makes no noise. It is super silent. Its fans are super quiet. And it's not a full PC. So it doesn't have like a graphics. It's, it's onboard graphics. It has like five NICs built in. It has a bunch of storage space. It's great. Um, they It's, I think, a P100 or a PT100, something like that. Um, those still exist, and they're a great deal. You can get them for like 500 bucks, and then you just buy a crap ton of storage. And you can get them between $500 and $1,000 with a real Xeon processor in it. And But they're big, right? They're like, you know, they're, they're, um, not, they're not micro PC. They're just, um, I don't know. I don't know what the right... I already forgot the right terminology, but they're like two, you know, a foot and a half tall. And I'd love to get a small little Mac mini size unit that has, you know, five, five terabytes of storage, five to 10 terabytes of storage. And, um, I need, I haven't looked that up recently, but I'd love a hobby kit. Someone give me a hobby kit. Um, Roy says, why not AMD? Because everything else I have, Roy is AMD. So I have, I have, oh, I'm sorry. I, I saw AMD and my mind went to uh, ARM. Sorry, ARM AMD is great. I would love AMD. Um, I just say Intel, meaning Intel, not the company. Intel compatible processor. Um, that's what I mean. So I need an Intel compatible server because everything else I have, including all my Macs, including my Raspberry Pis, they're all ARM. So I have plenty of ARM in my house, but not everything runs on ARM. So I need an, an AMD or Intel chip. Um, servers need to be in a separate room. <laughs> um, I know. I'd love to. I mean, it's technically a closet, so it is a separate room. Um, but you, but this, it's amazing how on mic you can pick up a server you know, five feet away from you in a closet that has sound panels on it. Like it's still, you can still hear it. Uh, and I'm, su and I'm super sensitive about sound, uh, while I have a airplane flying overhead, making jet noises on my microphone. Um, what is an, a Kubernetes operator? It is simply a, it's a, it's a pattern of writing controllers for Kubernetes to do things based on events that happen in Kubernetes. So look up operator pattern. You'll find some Red Hat documentation on it. And you'll find a very quick description of just look up operator pattern for Kubernetes. And you'll find a definition of what it generally means. But um, it's a controller or a series of controllers that add extra functionality to Kubernetes and do stuff. So you might have like a Postgres operator that you install in Kubernetes. And it might provide you APIs and, and or CLIs that allow you to manage Postgres clusters in an easier way that are more intelligent and can do special things like maybe snapshot or backup or, or excuse me, add a, add a, to, add a mirror um, to your Postgres or something like that. So that's not prayer. All right, people, I have thoroughly exhausted my voice. Two and a half hours, not a record. For the for the for the ones that wonder wonder, my record is DockerCon 2020, eight hours, maybe even nine hours straight of live streaming and talking. I had a lot of guests, so I didn't do all the talking. But I will see you here next week. So who we got on the show next week? Um, let me tell you. We got a bunch of guests. We have months of booked guests. So coming up, um, we are, by the way, next week, I'm having a special live stream on Tuesday. Almost forgot to tell you about this. So on um, the 16th, so Tuesday, next week, special live stream with Loft Labs. So Loft Labs has been on this show before. They were here last year talking about V Cluster, a really cool project. It gets a lot of attention because it's running clusters in clusters. And they're working on something new. 
So if you go over to brett.live, I don't normally do Tuesday live streams, but we talked about it and they wanted to they wanted to get the, the word out on this new project they're working on. So um, they're gonna be coming up. You see them right here? So that's next Tuesday. And yeah, I'm gonna have Lucas and Rich on again. These were two fine people that were on here last year. And we're gonna talk about uh, a topic. The topic is dev containers for developers, right? Open source. And they've got some new software they wanna talk about. And it's a little hush hush, a little secret. So we're gonna do that on Tuesday. And then next Thursday is, let me see if I can find who's gonna be on next Thursday. So again, we're live every Thursday. Um, I'm gonna have Cycle on again. So Jake Warner, the CEO and founder of Cycle. If you don't know about Cycle, I had them on a couple of years ago, and they're an alternative to orchestration for containers. They have their own in-house orchestrator, their own Linux server design in terms of the OS and distribution. And they it's basically all in. It's you you do you use their that networking, their GUI, their proprietary stuff all on any cloud you want. And I wanted to find out what the, what has happened in the last two years. I had a model that was a really interesting idea for those teams that maybe were like the kind of team that might be looking at just using AWS App Runner or, or and keeping it simple. Or they don't want to manage their own Kubernetes and they find the whole paradigm of Kubernetes a little bit unnecessarily complex, which is a thing. And maybe you're a solo DevOps person like me, where you're the only DevOps person in the DevOps team. You're the only one that's caring about infrastructure. And so, and maybe you don't want to manage your own Swarm servers, or maybe you you want to do more than what Swarm provides. You want not just, you, you don't want to have to manage the OS. Maybe you want a, a thing that's going to manage the networking, the security, and everything else all in one. So Jake is going to be on the show next Thursday to talk about Cycle I.O. And then after that, we've got Michael Cade coming on from Veeam to talk about Kasten, which is a Kubernetes backup solution. We've got Brendan Burns going to be here from Microsoft. He is one of the founders of the Kubernetes project. We're going to be talking about the future of containers, which is quite possibly one of my favorite topics of all time. Um, we got Multipass. Nathan from Canonical is going to come on the show to talk about Multipass. We had them on a couple years ago. I love Multipass. It's one of my favorite tools for spinning up little local VMs and doing things and tearing it down. Um, and then we've got Josh from Ufizzy on later this summer to talk about ephemeral environments, or maybe you, want to, you might call them um, preview environments, or if anything that's temporary where you need to rapidly spin up and tear down Kubernetes, Ufizzy is a solution for that. They integrate well with GitHub Actions. They have a great little set of GitHub Actions, and they're gonna be on the show as well. So we're gonna talk about how to automate preview and ephemeral environments for your Kubernetes setups. Well, it's not even for your Kubernetes setups because they run it for you, but um, they've got open source, they've got uh, free tiers and all that stuff. So we're gonna have them on the show as well. All right, people, um, I see the rest of your questions. Multipass, by <laughs> big bada boom. Um, big, big bada boom, multipass. So yes, thank you fine people for being here. Um, I see all of your questions, but I've been talking for two and a half hours, so I'm gonna have to end it here. So sorry, if you have questions about the job experience stuff, I see you uh, asking questions about that. Watch this show. We just talked about a whole bunch of stuff, including getting into DevOps, how to get started at length. We talked about that a lot. So watch this show, do the DVR and rewind the show. Watch it in two, two times speed like Eric likes to do. And I will see you next week here on YouTube Live. On Tuesday, special live show. Don't forget that one. And then again on Thursday. All right. Ciao, everybody.